Mr. President, council members, and participants, we are now live. Thank you, and good morning, everyone. Uh, we're going to get started. Uh, we have established our quorum. So I'm going to make the following announcement. Due to the continuing threat to public health from COVID-19 and its variants, city council committees are currently meeting remotely. Uh, we may adjust that in the near future. We are using Microsoft Teams to make these remote hearings possible. Instructions for how the public may view and offer public testimony at a public hearing of council committee are included in the public hearing notices that are published in the Daily News, the Inquirer, and Legal Intelligencer prior to the hearings and can also be found on phlcouncil.com. I now note that the hour has come. Mr. Christmas, will you please call the roll to take attendance? Members that are in attendance, please indicate that you are present when your name is called. Council Lady Bass. Good morning, Mr. President, colleagues in the city of Philadelphia. Good morning. Good morning. Council Lady Brooks. Good morning, Council President and colleagues. I'm present. Good morning. Councilman Driscoll. Good morning, Council President. I'm, pre I'm present. Good morning. Council Lady Godier. Good morning, Council President and colleagues in Philadelphia. Present. Good morning. Council Lady Gilmore Richardson. Good morning, Council President. Good morning, colleagues. I am present. Good morning. Councilman Harity. Councilman Johnson. Good morning, Council President. Good morning, colleagues. Good morning. Councilman Jones. Good morning, Mr. President, colleagues, and go birds. Council Lady Lazada. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. I'm present. Good morning. Councilman L. Good morning, Council President. Good morning, colleagues. I'm present. Good morning. Councilman O'Neill. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Councilman Phillips. Good morning, Council President and colleagues. I am present. Councilman Squilla. Good morning, President, colleagues. Present. Good morning. Councilman Thomas. Good morning, Council President. Good morning, colleagues. Good morning to the listening public. I'm present. Good morning. Council Lady Vaughn. Good morning, everyone. I am here. Good morning. Council President Clark. And good morning to all. I believe Councilman Harry will be joining us shortly. He's having some challenges with the technology. Um, so we've established our quorum. So this is the public hearing of the committee as a whole regarding resolutions number 220 uh, Mr. Christmas, would you please read the titles of all the resolutions? Resolution 220690, appointing Jeffrey Brown to the Board of Directors for the Old City District. And Resolution 220689, appointing Mequon Brinkley to the Board of Directors for the Old City District. Resolution 221036, appointing Paul Badger to the Board of Directors of the Center City District. Resolution 221037, appointing Valeria Bears to the Board of Directors for the Center City District. And Resolution 221038, appointing Anna Bonney to the Board of Directors of the Center City District. Thank you. Uh, before we begin to hear testimony from the witnesses we have for the day, everyone ha who has been invited to the meeting to testify should be aware that this is a public hearing and it's being recorded. Because the hearing is public, participants and viewers have no reasonable expectation of privacy. So by continuing to be in the meeting, you are consenting to being recorded. Additionally, prior to recognizing members for questions or comments they have for witnesses, I will note for the record at this time, we will use the chat feature available in Microsoft Teams to allow members to signify that they wish to be recognized. In order to comply with the Sunshine Act, the chat feature must only be used for this particular purpose. Mr. Christmas, will you please call the first witness to testify? Ms. Jennifer Nagel, board chair of the Old City District. 
Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Um, good morning, Council President Clark, Council Member Squilla, and all members of Council. My name is Jennifer Nagel. I'm the Chair of the Board of Directors of the Old City Special Services District. I'm here to testify in support of Resolution 220-689 and 220-690 relating to the appointments of um, the board for the district. Resolution 220-689 appoints Mequon Brinkley to the board of the Old City Special Services District. Mr. Brinkley is the owner and art curator at Thinker Maker Society, which opened in the neighborhood in March 2022. Uh, Mr. Brinkley is also the member of Old City District's Marketing Committee and has served on this committee since 2001. Resolution 220-690 appoints Jeffrey Brown to the board of the Old City Special Services District. Mr. Brown is the owner of Jeffrey M. Brown Associates, LLC, a building and construction management company, which developed its developed and owns Bridge on Race, a large apartment building at 2nd and Race Streets. He is also a member of the Old City District's Economic Development Committee and has served on this committee since 2017. Uh, Mr. Brown is not the mayoral candidate. This is a separate uh, Jeffrey Brown. Um, as of May 18th, 2022, the meeting of the Old City District Board of Directors unanimous, unanimously voted to support the nominations of Mr. Brinkley and Mr. Brown. Um, I thank you for your time and I'm happy to answer any questions as it involves the board of the Old City District. Thank you very much. I'm glad you clarified that. I was going to say he may not be qualified um, being given his involvement in politics if he were that Mr. Brown. Uh, are there any questions or comments from members of the committee? Seeing none, thank you very much. And next up, we have Paul Levy, uh, President and CEO of the Center City District. Good morning, Council President. Good morning, Councilman Squill and all other members of Council. My name is Paul Levy. I'm President of the Center City District. I'm here to testify in support of Council Resolutions 221036, 37, and 38, nominating three individuals to the Board of Directors of the Center City District. In keeping with the provisions of our original founding act, these members were nominated by the sitting members of the Board of Directors of the CCD to fill vacancies on our board. The three individuals we're putting in front of you today and their bios were attached and some material will be sent is Valeria Bears, who's a senior managing director of CBRE, a major commercial real estate brokerage firm. She could not join us today because she is traveling. Secondly, Paul Badger, president and CEO of the Badger Group to replace a, re, a re expiring term. I believe Paul is on this call. And third, Anna Bonney, who's the executive vice president of Parkway Corporation to replace Joe Zaritsky for a term that ends at the end of 2026. Should you approve these three nominees, the board of the Center City District will be 38% minority members, 33% women with a strong mix of commercial office, hospitality, retail, and residential representation. I thank you very much for the opportunity to testify and I'm available to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Levy. Uh, let the record show that Councilman Harity has joined the committee. Good morning, Councilman. Uh, any questions? I'm sorry, I had some technical difficulties. Uh, I couldn't log in this morning, but I'm here now. Yeah, we, we talked about that earlier. I knew you'd be here. Uh, thank you, Councilman. Um, any questions or comments uh, for either of these witnesses? We'll see any? There being no further questions from the members of the committee and no other witnesses to testify, I would ask, is there anyone else present to this hearing who would fail to call and who wishes to offer testimony on a resolution being considered today. Hearing none, I want to thank all of the witnesses for their participation today. Uh, we value your opinion. And I, I now invite all witnesses to please disconnect from the hearing before we go into our public meeting. And we will have a brief pause as the participants leave the hearing.
Thank you. We now go into our public meeting to consider the action to be taken with the resolution before the committee today. Uh, we will now convene the public meeting. And Mr. Christmas, will you please call the roll to take attendance? Council Lady Bass. Present. Council Lady Brooks. Present. Councilman Driscoll. Present. Council Lady Godier. Council Lady Gilmore Richardson. I'm present. Councilman Harrity. I am present. Councilman Johnson. Councilman Jones. Present. Council Lady Lazada. Present. Councilman O. Present. Councilman O'Neill. Present. Councilman Phillips. Present. Councilman Squilla. Councilman Thomas. I'm present. Sorry about that. Council Lady Vaughn. Present. Councilman Clark. Present. Uh, we've Thank established you. a quorum, Councilman. Thank you. I'm present, Council President. I had a technical Thank difficulty. I'm here. Thank you. Let the record on the fact that Councilman Johnson is also present. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, we will now go into our public meeting. Uh, the motion to report resolutions number 220-690-220-689-221-036-221-037-221038 from the Committee of Favorable Recommendation. And the chair recognizes Council Member Jones for a motion on resolution 220-690-220-689-221-036-221-037-221-038. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that resolutions number 220-690-220-689-221-036-221-037 and 221-037. 038 be moved from this committee with a favorable recommendation and be um, moved to our next session of council. Second. Thank you. It's been moved and probably second. The resolution number 220-690-220-689-221-036. I'm sorry. 221-037 and 221-038 be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation at our next session of council. All those in favor of the motion will signify by saying aye. 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 Ayes have it. Motion carries in resolution number 220-690-220-689-221-036-221-037 and 221-038 will be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation at our next session of council. This concludes the business before the committee of the whole today regarding the board appointments. I remind everyone that the committee will continue again at 10 a.m. for our school partnership hearing. Thank you all very much for your participation. See you shortly. Thank you. Mr. President, council members, and participants, we are now live. Thank you. Thank you. Good, and good, morning. President. good. Thank you. And good morning to everyone. Thank you for good being morning. here today. What's up, Jim? Hello. <laughs> Councilman. What's up, we're Jim? Councilman, we're live. Oh, excuse me, sir. <laughs> <laughs> it's just South Philly things, that's all. I understand. <laughs> we normally have the same thing going on up north. Now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, good morning. Uh, this is the public meeting and public hearing of the City Council Committee as a whole. The Board of Education and the Mayor are called to order. Uh, Mr. Christmas, can you please call a roll? Council Lady Bass. Good morning. I am present. Council Lady Brooks. Councilman Driscoll. Good morning. I am present. 
Council Lady Godier. Council Lady Gilmore Richardson. Good morning, Mr. President. Good morning, colleagues. I am present. Councilman Harrity. Councilman I am Johnson. present. Councilman Harrity is counted. Councilman Johnson. Present. Councilman Jones. Good morning, Mr. President. Good morning, Mr. Mayor and team. Good morning, school district. I am present. Good morning. Council, Council Lady Lozada. Good morning, everyone. I am present. Good morning. Councilman O. Councilman O'Neill. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Councilman Phillips. Good morning, colleagues. Uh, good morning, Council President, and good morning, School District of Philadelphia, and also our viewing public. Good morning. I'm here. Councilman Swilla. Councilman Thomas. Good morning, everybody. I'm present. Council Lady Vaughn. Good morning, everyone. Council President Clark. Hey, good morning, everyone. And thank you for being here. Uh, the quorum of the council has been established. And at this time, I'd like to rest, recognize the presence of the Board of Education members and the mayor. This public meeting and public hearing of the Council Committee of the Whole, the Board of Education and the Mayor are for the purpose of coordinating our activities for the improvement and benefit of public education in the city of Philadelphia, as required by Section 12-209 of the Philadelphia Home Rule Charter and City Council Resolution Number 181014. Mr. Christmas, can you please read the title of the resolution? Resolution 181014 calling for the Council Committee of the Whole to convene public meetings and public hearings pursuant to the educational supplement of the Philadelphia Home Rule Charter to review the administration, management, and operations of finances of the school district and adopt plans to coordinate the activities of the Board of Education, the Mayor, and the City Council for the improvement and benefit of public education in Philadelphia. Thank you. Uh, joining us today are Mayor James Kinney, the Board of Education President Reginald Streeter and Board Vice President Mallory Spitz Lopez, Board Members Sarah Ashley Andrews, Julia Danzi, Leticia Igia Hinton, uh, Chow Wing Lam, Lisa Sally, Cecilia Thompson, and Joyce Wilkerson, School Superintendent Dr. Tony B. Watlington, and Student Representative Sophia Roach in Love Speech. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to today's hearing. Uh, our annual, biannual partnership meeting has been productive and we look forward to continuing this great relationship that we have for the children of the city of Philadelphia. The agenda today will go as follows. First Mayor Kitty will be recognized for remarks. Then Board President Resident Streeter will be recognized for the purpose of introducing Board of Education members and the school district superintendent. The board will make a presentation on its current and upcoming initiatives followed by questions and comments from the council members. Then Dr. Tony Watlington will then be recognized for a presentation of school district initiative and plans for the current school year, followed by questions and comments from city council members. And we will then move to our public hearing for testimony from members of the public and then adjournment. At this time, I'd like to recognize Chair of Education in the City of Philadelphia City Council, Councilman Isaiah Thomas for remarks. Good morning, Council President. Good morning, colleagues. Good morning to our partners at the school district and good morning to our mayor, Mayor Kenny. Uh, thank you to everybody for coming together to have an important conversation around the state of education and the conditions that our schools are in, as well as the conditions that our students and our employees are essentially dealing with. Um, I'm excited about today's dialogue and I look forward to our continued partnership as it relates to making sure that every young person in the city of Philadelphia, no matter what zip code they live in, has access to a quality education. Council President, thank you for your leadership and I'll turn it back over to you so we can do a deeper dive into today's scheduled conversation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for your comments and your hard work on behalf of the citizens and the children of the city of Philadelphia. This time I recognize Mayor James Kenney for remarks. Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning and thank you for having me here today. 
It is my pleasure to be with, here, with, with you to discuss what I consider to be one of our city's most essential functions, educating our youth and the strength and future of our public education system. Quality education continues to be a core priority for our administration. I know it does for city council also. From educating our youngest learners to our older adults, education is a critical component for the city's economic and social health. We have served more than 13,000 and hopefully 15,000 by the end of this year, children and their families through free pre-K, quality pre-K programming with PHL Pre-K. Increased school-based mental health services, connected 22,500 families to free internet with PHL Connected, and created additional student and family support at 20 community schools. Since 2016, the city has spent over $1.2 billion to improve the school district of Philadelphia, an historic increase in our investment, and I thank council for their, their, their help in getting this done. Let's not forget our, our return of the school district to a locally controlled school board, removing Harrisburg from day-to-day -day oversight of our city schools. All this would not have been possible without the partnership of the leaders here in city council and the school district and the board of education. But I know I also come before you today on the precipice of a new le of new leadership in our city and state. Dr. Watlington assumed his role as our new superintendent just last summer. We have a new board president, Reginald Streeter. We have a new governor, and we will have a new mayor this time next year. We can make a lot of progress in the year to come. I'm committed to expanding our partnership, and I call on our new and future leaders to do the same. We can make real change for children by continuing to invest in our schools, in our children, and in our educators. We are here together for our children, for our city, and for our future. I thank you and look forward to this meeting and moving on together into a very successful final year of the administration. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for your remarks and your commitment to public education in the city of Philadelphia. We really thank appreciate you. it. Thank, thank you. I would like to at this time to recognize Board President Reginald Streeter for a presentation by the board. Good morning. Thank you for having us here today to share updates with you on the Board of Education's work. I would like to take a moment to introduce my colleagues on the board, um, Vice President Mallory Fix Lopez um, and board members, Sarah Ashley Andrews, Julia Danzi, Leticia Ahea Hinton, Chow Wing Lam, Lisa Sally, Cecilia Thompson, Joyce Wilkerson, and I'm the board president, Reginald Streeter. I would also like to welcome and congratulate the newest members of Philadelphia City Council who were elected in special elections in November. We look forward to working with you and other members of the City Council as partners in this work to support our students, student learners, and school communities. On behalf of the board, I would also like to thank Mayor Kenny, Council President Clark, and each member of City Council for the opportunity to be with you here today and for your partnership and service to the students of, in Philadelphia. Please move to the next slide. Today, we would like to provide you with important updates since our last meeting in May. We will share updates on the board's new leadership for 2023, our vision for the School District of Philadelphia, the implementation of goals and guardrails, the board's five-year plan to increase student achievement, and discuss four education priorities in which we need your support and partnership to further expand on the progress toward our goals and guardrails. Please move to the next slide. At the December 15th action meeting, the Board of Education held its annual organization meeting and elected new leaders, myself, Reginald Streeter as president, and Mallory Fix Lopez as vice president. And we immediately began serving our one year term. We replaced Joyce S. Wilkerson as president and Leticia Ahea Hinton as vice president, who opted to leave their leadership roles, but who will thankfully remain on the board to offer their experience and insight in guiding our work forward. I am deeply appreciative, honored, and humbled for the opportunity to serve as president of the Philadelphia Board of Education. I would like to once again thank the board for its vote of confidence in me. However, no person is an island, and I look forward to working with my colleagues on the board, members of city council, and the mayor to do the critical work for our students and school communities. My background includes being appointed to the board in 2021. I'm a graduate of Germantown High School and have two learners attending a Philadelphia public school 
I'm an attorney at Bergamonte, practicing an employment unpaid wage group, and serve as a fierce advocate for historically disempowered people in the law and in the public in general. And I strongly believe that public education is not only a civil right, but it's also a human right. Board Vice President Fix Lopez, appointed to the board in 2018, is currently an assistant professor of English ESL, English as a Second Language, at the Community College of Philadelphia and is an adjunct faculty member in Educational Linguistics at the Graduate School of Education at the University of Pennsylvania. Vice President Fix Lopez also regularly consults with biomedical research institutions across the United States to support professional development efforts focused on effective science communication for their intentional researchers. Finally, she lives in, in South Philadelphia with her husband and two learners, and her oldest child attends George, S. Child, George W. Child School. Board Vice President Fix Lopez will continue the presentation. Please move to the next slide. Thank you. Thank you, President Streeter, and good morning. I would like to point out that the latest board member group photo on this slide is missing board member Cecilia Thompson, but we hope to have an updated photo with all nine of us very soon. We want to begin our conversation today by resharing our commitment to student achievement and the work ahead. We remain committed to the following priorities. First, we will double down on goals and guardrails, which will focus on in the next, which we will focus on in the next slide. Our goals and guardrails allow us to focus decision making and the district's resources on a student-centered approach to educating our learners and not be guided by the over -polit -polit politicization of education and discrete issues. Second, we aspire to improve our collective communication, stakeholder engagement, and further center the voice of parent, student, and teachers. Third, we will continue to seek greater collaboration with the city, state, and federal governments, and continue our advocacy efforts for collaboration, funding, and support. Fourth, we will continue our attempt to have one system of education that works in harmony and alignment, and will create mechanisms that survive the test of time so that we can move to a public education system that becomes less politicized. Last but not least, we aim to give our new superintendent the runway necessary to continue his strategic planning process, which may require us to go slow so that we can eventually go fast. Above all, we aspire to be effective and passionate advocates and stewards, stewards that our students deserve. Board member Thompson will now continue this update. Please move to the next slide. Thank you, Vice President Fix Lopez. We want to share an update on our five-year strategic plan, Goals and Guardrails, which we adopted in December 2020. As a reminder, we have five academic goals focused on reading, math, and college and career readiness for all students. Just as importantly, our plan also includes four guardrails which we believe are the conditions necessary to help our students learn and achieve. Our four guardrails foster welcoming and supportive schools, enriching and well-rounded school experiences, partnering with parents and family members, and addressing racist practices within the school district. During our monthly action meetings, board members devote time to monitoring progress by reviewing data that indicates how on track the school district is to achieving the plan's objectives. Goals and guardrails have allowed the board to set clear expectations for student success, monitor progress towards those expectations, and to adopt a budget and policies that provide supports based on the needs of our students. The goals and guardrails were central to our superintendent search process. And we believe we have the right leader in Dr. Watlington to carry out these goals. The board has been monitoring the progress of goals and guardrails for two years now. This monitoring has helped the board identify our students' needs and guided our decision making and investments in targeted strategies and resources. We encourage you to attend a board meeting and become engaged with our work on student achievement. Board member Wilkerson will continue the presentation. Please move to the next slide. Thank you, board member Thompson. We now like to turn our, to our priorities for the school district of Philadelphia. The board has four key priorities to help improve the academic achievement and well-being of our students. 
These priorities include one, fully funding the district schools, two, upgrading our facilities, three, addressing gun violence, and four, having fully staffed schools. Board member Sally will continue the presentation. Thank you, board member Wilkinson. First, I would like to begin by acknowledging Mayor Kinney's commitment to supporting public education during his tenure as mayor as he enters his last budget season. We also greatly appreciate the support that city council has provided to the school district over the years. These partnerships are vital to supporting our school communities and working together in the best interest of our students and learners. As you know, the School District of Philadelphia is the only school district in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania that cannot raise its own taxes. And the district is completely dependent on our local and state elected officials to provide such resources necessary to ensure that every student in the city has access to a quality public education that prepares them for future success. According to an analysis by the Public Interest Law Center and the Education Law Center, the school district would need an, an additional $1.14 billion annually to meet the educational needs of our students. This includes an, an additional $318 million in annual funding from the city. The current system of funding education in Pennsylvania shortchanges school districts like Philadelphia, so the board has been urging the Pennsylvania General Assembly to provide a fair, adequate, and predictable funding system that enables all learners to meet state academic standards and one that does not discriminate against low wealth school districts. We ask for your continued support and advocating for our students. We are also calling on you to balance the needs of our students with the needs of residents and to commit to fully funding our schools by increasing the annual appropriations by $315 million within the next four years. We need your support and partnership to continue and sustain the investments the district has been able to make over recent years and to ensure that every student has access to an education that allows him or her or them to thrive and succeed in a global society. Board member Mallory Fix Lopez will continue this presentation. Please move to the next slide. Thank you, Board Member Sally. We would now like to focus on school district facilities. We know you share our goal of ensuring schools are safe, welcoming, and healthy spaces where students and staff want to be and learn each day. We know that the average age of our school buildings is 70 years old, and according to a 2017 analysis of school district facilities, the district's deferred maintenance costs total $4.5 billion. Also, according to that 2017 analysis, additionally, 85 of our school buildings should be considered for renovation and 21 buildings should be considered for closure and replacement. That said, we are making substantial investments in capital environmental improvements to our school facilities. Last year, we committed to investing $325 million of federal stimulus funds over four years on major projects and renovations. This was on top of and in addition to the already approved plan bringing our total capital investments to $2 billion over the next six years. Current improvements include new construction projects such as Cassidy, major renovations and site improvements including classroom additions, playgrounds, parking facilities, and major interior and exterior improvements, and environmental improvements including more than 4,400 asbestos-related abatement actions in, two, in 241 buildings were completed in 2022. At least 168 schools now have lead-safe or lead-free certifications. We've installed more, thousand, more than 1,665 hydration stations and recently won a $5 million grant from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency to help reach our goal of one hydration station for every 100 students within the next five years. 
but more work and more resources like the $318 million annually needed and asked for by the city are needed to make sure all of our students are learning in buildings that prepare them for the future and for future success. The school district cannot shoulder this financial burden alone. We need our city and state partners to invest in our infrastructure so that we can accelerate the work we are doing. We look forward to partnering with you in our work to improve the conditions of our school facilities throughout the district. Board member Andrews will continue the presentation. Please move to the next slide. Thank you, Board Vice President Fix Lopez. I would now like to address gun violence in the city. I'm sure you will all agree that there is an urgent need to decrease levels of gun violence in the city to keep our learners safe wherever they are, but especially as they go to and from school. We applaud the work of Mayor Kenny and City Council to implement new programming and dedicate funding to address this current crisis, but more needs to be done to protect our young people. The school district has put in place a number of measures to address safe passage to and from school. However, addressing gun violence requires a coordinated and comprehensive response. Last spring, we came to you with specific as to support putting programs in place to keep students safe when they are not in school. We ask that you first increase the safe corridors around all schools during travel times to and from school. Earlier this year, with funding from the Commonwealth, the school district announced the first phase of a new Safe Paths program where paid community members help ensure safe passage to and from school for our young people. But currently, it is dependent upon a grant and federal funding. So we are asking you to increase the funding for integrated town watch services to replicate and expand the Safe Path program. Second, we want to ensure young people have safe places after school, on weekends, during the summer, and other days when schools are closed. At the request of city council last spring, the school district identified schools in every council-made district where we would make school buildings available to community organizations during non-school hours so that young people have a safe place to be. But providing safe places for young people cannot be the school district's responsibility alone. So we are asking you to provide adequate funding for all libraries and recreation centers so that they can open after school on the weekends and through the summer. Additionally, we ask for your support in enforcing curfews and expanding curfew centers throughout the city. Third, create safety zones around schools and enforce gun laws. While state preemption laws are frustrating, our current laws, including the prohibition of gun possession by minors, must be enforced by police and the district attorney to keep our community safe. So we are asking you to ensure our police officers enforce current laws and partner with the district attorney to ensure that they are that there are appropriate consequences for those who break the law. Fourth, we would like to expand mental health services. The school district has implemented a number of programs to support the social and emotional health of our school communities. For instance, we have a rapid response program in schools to help our communities respond to tragic events. And we have put in place additional programs under Dr. Watlington's leadership to support the mental and emotional health of our students and staff. However, our programs are not enough. Our young people and staff need additional support outside of the school system. So we must work together to provide a multi-pronged approach to addressing mental health care, the mental health care provider shortage in the city. We are calling on you to implement programs designed to build our provider capacity through the creation of a Philadelphia Mental Health Service Corp, where public funding could be used to provide training, scholarships, loan repayment and loan repayment to those who commit to working with Philadelphians impacted by gun violence and trauma as we as we as well as the public workforce and the establishment of public private partnerships to increase the number of mental health care providers modeled after the University of Pennsylvania's Leonard A. Lauder Community Care Nurse Practitioner Program. The critical point that I would like to make is that if we want our learners to learn thrive and succeed, then we must ensure that they are safe and that their physical and emotional health is intact so that they are ready to learn. And we hope you will support our efforts to safeguard our learners and help them realize their fullest potential in life. Board Member Lamb will now continue the presentation. Please move to the next slide.
Thank you, Board Member Andrews. Due to funding constraints referenced earlier, the school district is at a competitive staffing disadvantage. Our financial position forces us to make decisions based on revenue rather than on need. As a result, staff at the school district on average make less than their peers working in better funded suburban districts. Additionally, our staff are more likely to work in old school buildings where limited revenue has forced the district to defer maintenance projects in favor of adding critical staff and investing in classrooms. Despite our funding challenges, the school district has worked hard to address these issues. The school district and the Philadelphia Federation of Teachers agreed to a new contract in 2021 that includes a 9% raise over three years. To ensure our students have access to high quality educators, we are calling on you to partner with the school district on recruitment and retention. We are asking you to commit to one, provide street parking around schools for school staff. Many of our school buildings do not have parking spaces. As a result, school-based staff might have to park blocks away from schools. In neighborhoods where we have seen increases in violence, our school-based staff has safety concerns. Two, provide SEPTA passes for school-based staff who use public transit. Three, provide loan forgiveness, housing vouchers, and other incentives for Philadelphia residents to work in Philadelphia schools. Board President Streeter will continue this presentation. Please move to the next slide. Thank you, Board Member Lamb. I want, to end our, I want to end our presentation by reiterating how strongly we believe in the importance of working together. We cannot do this work without your support and collaboration. The board is dedicated to working in partnership with you to ensure the district is best positioned to meet the needs of our young people who deserve a safe and nurturing school community where they are valued, respected, and encouraged. Again, we need you. Again, we need you and understand that it is our collective responsibility to come together and serve as a village for our children to support, educate, protect, and inspire them to reach their greatest potential, especially when they face daunting challenges to, to their success and well-being. On, on behalf of the board, I thank you for your continued partnership and support for our schools. We are now happy to answer questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, President Streeter and members of the board for your presentation. Um, I have a, a number of questions. I want to try to consolidate the questions and then um, have get answers from you either today or actually by Dr. Watlington, because I know there's a significant overlap uh, in the things that we interact with you all with respect to funding buildings and all the other aspects of the school operation. And then uh, uh, ask my colleagues uh, who have an interest in questions or comments. Um, President Streeter, um, during the course of the presentation by various members, uh, there was one issue with respect to the federal dollars uh, that came uh, particularly around capital. Um, I'd like to see if you could provide us uh, at some point, not necessarily now, um, but for the uh, federal dollars for infrastructure, what would the uh, challenge have been? Because we got a sense that during the course of the uh, infrastructure vote. It was going to be money flowing to various needs as it relates to buildings, school buildings, and all bridges and all the other things in it. So if you can give us a scenario that but for those federal dollars, so we can actually see where this gap that you just referenced is. Uh, is it based for not enough federal infrastructure dollars or, you know, just some shortfalls in local revenue stream? Um, with respect to that, I do want to also get a sense of um, your uh, projected um, deficit in out years based on um, the revenue stream from the city of Philadelphia. Um, we have in the city, on the city side, we are experiencing a relatively um, higher than projected um, fund balance over the next couple of years. And I just, I don't know, particularly given the fact that the school district gets 55% of uh, those dollars versus 45 for the city. Uh, if you all had experienced a um, significant increase in your fund balance as a result of these 
high assessments and all the other revenues coming off of the pandemic. Um, the other issue with respect to school buildings, um, we continue to have uh, school buildings uh, that there are conversations about. Uh, I've talked to you, uh, not Re uh, President Streeter, but Dr. Uh, Dr. Watlington, and prior to that, uh, the former uh, school district superintendent about the use of buildings uh, that, that are currently vacant in my district, and I'm assuming that across the city of Philadelphia. Um, we had a conversation, as this was before you, Dr. Watlington, uh, about the potential of a school authority um, as it relates to um, renovation and potential new construction of school. Um, as we said the way to, from the prior uh, superintendent, that conversation kind of got lost and some of my colleagues actually left to run for various offices. So they ran for a and that conversation kind of went away. That was an, that was an interesting thought. Uh, they would have given people the ability to participate, uh, all uh, parties and interested parties, and also move it along so school district can focus on educating children as opposed to putting their fingers in the dikes as has happened over the last several years as it relates to school building. Um, I'll tell you, I had a lot of them. I'm going to just put them all and then you can get back to me. Safety issues uh, with respect to cameras. Uh, I know in our last budget, uh, we we in the administration put money for safety cameras. We had a big press conference, the mayor and members of council, and I think it was out in Bartram, Councilman Johnson School, where we talked about um, providing money for the exterior to assist um, both the proposal to have um, safe passages with actual parents or volunteers um, and the ability to manage that through a real-time uh, camera surveillance system. Need to get a sense of that. Um, I'm going to actually leave that whole parking issue alone. Uh, God bless you on that one. Um, I'm sure there are a lot of people that would like to have parking <laughs> on their street, let alone uh, at their workplace. So I'll, I'll let you figure that out. And one last one. Um, with respect to um, the taxes, is it the position of the board the, the preferences for the school board, like other uh, counties and municipalities across the state, to raise revenue via a school district raising taxes as opposed to city council authorizing the tax increase. So I know there's a lot of questions. I don't expect you to answer them all now. Just wanted to get them out there um, so we can see in it, the timely way, either if you can answer some now and if you need to uh, review and forward those in writing or some course or the course of this, this public hearing. Well, I, I can Excuse address the council president. Hmm. Yes. Is the council major? Just, just for clarity for a point of information. I know we, we did make a commitment to provide funding for cameras and just based upon my recent work with uh, representatives from the district, um, that funding to date has not um, and release from the Philadelphia Police Department to the actual school district. And so um, hopefully that we can address that during this particular hearing because obviously we're in a state of emergency when it comes to gun violence. And it's been a year since we actually did that press conference outside of um, John Bartram High School. And so um, we have to work with a level of expediency um, around this issue. I just want to note that um, just for the record, we can do a deeper dive later on and they're hearing particularly around the issue of the cameras and making sure they could have should have been installed, to be quite frank with you. But to my knowledge, the funding has not even been released to the district just yet. Just want to state that for the record and thank you for your latitude, Council President, before we get into the full discussion. Yeah, Councilman. Yeah, um that good good point. Uh, it's a similar situation with the housing authority, because we also put money uh in the budget for the housing authority dollars. Um you'll get um, whatever response, but I, we actually there's a kind of got a, somewhat of a response from the city of Philadelphia with respect to those the release of those funding. So that's this will play out during the course of the hearing. We'll hear from the school district their perspective on uh, why they um, um, well, as they say, uh, not in receipt of those dollars. But thank you, thank you, Councilman uh, President Streeter. I'm sorry for the interruption, oh, sir. No, it's okay. I, this is your forum. I'm I'm a, I'm a visitor here. Um, I'm, thank you. Very happy to be here, though. Um, so 
I, I just want to address a few things that you uh, you mentioned. Uh, so as it relates to the board uh, asking for a, a power authority to raise taxes, uh, that's not that was not the point of that comment. The point of that comment was to just reiterate how much we need you. Right. It's really meant to say we need you. We need you. We need you. Um, and I think uh, in addition to that, it's important to note um, we are very appreciative of the 55 percent that you mentioned that we get very appreciative of that. But when we look at what children just right outside of the city get to educate their children um, per, per pupil is 60 cent on a dollar that we get. Again, I'm not blaming anyone. These are just our budgetary realities. And that's why we look at our budget in the way we in the way that we do. As it relates to uh, the federal dollars, um, you know, we, we're trying to be great stewards with public dollars, but we see that there's going to be a fiscal cliff in, uh, in the uh, in the year 2025, and that's something that we're also worried about and preparing for as well. Um, and try to take notes here. And as far as the, uh, the 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 parking authority issue, again, we're raising it here in this venue, um, just seeking help and support on that. I think uh, Vice President Mallory Fix Lopez can add a little context while we're really beating this uh, this drum. Yeah, thank you, and I appreciate that, President Streeter. Um, in particular, with the with the parking authority. So we came last year and asked about this, and I think last year um, it was very similar response to this year of kind of I think it, the quote was "Good luck with that." Um, and and frankly, you know, what concerns me the most is if we can't figure out parking for public school teachers, I feel that we're doomed as a city and we're not going to be able to figure out public education. Um, one of the things that we know is students need teachers that look like them, right? We've talked about the need for black and brown teachers in the city of Philadelphia. We are working very hard on that. One of the things that we get, one of the main pieces of feedback we get when we go to different schools around the city is that I don't feel safe coming to my school. We, uh, one particular school was, um, at the time, Sheridan, they've recently changed their name, but Sheridan Elementary is is losing staff and is, and is uh, difficult to staff school because the teachers say, there's no place for me to park. I do not feel safe taking public transportation. The K&A stop is not a stop that I feel comfortable getting off at, let alone have students to get off at. There's no safe areas in the neighborhood for me to park at, especially because I don't have a parking permit, right? Because I live in West Philly and I travel to Kensington to teach. There's nowhere for me to park. I end up blocks and blocks away and I don't feel safe. That is a battle that the school district is not able to solve. That is a city issue. And so I think that it's a last ditch effort for us to ask for the parking support because you know, the city has not created safe neighborhoods in some places for teachers to actually go then to teach. So if you can't, if we, if you, if the city can't make those areas safe, at the very least we could do is ask for parking closer to the schools for teachers because their public transportation options options are also not safe. So at the end of the day, of saying, you know, I I I am very troubled by the response of city officials of good luck with that and God bless you in that effort because. You know, if we cannot figure out parking, we are not going to be able to figure out a four billion dollar deferred maintenance issue, let alone all the other layers of struggle. Thank, thank you for that response, and 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 thank you for um, chastising me for saying good luck with that. Um, it was, was rather flippant, uh, but the reality is is that this parking issue in the city of Philadelphia is an ever growing problem every day for everybody. And that's why I said it in the way I said it, because the policies that established high density developments with no requirement for off street parking, um, the levels of the pace of construction was, I think, frankly speaking, unforeseen um, as it relates to a lot of different neighborhoods. Um, so I say that based on the reality of every day there's a conversation about nowhere to park. Um, it's just a challenge. So I don't know how you resolve it, you know, we did this residential permit parking issue. That's frankly speaking, not really working all that well. Um, the issue with respects to contractors coming in doing work, business people, they also requested parking for themselves and their employees in their neighborhoods. So it is a very challenging issue. And maybe I shouldn't have been as flippant, but it's just every day I get beat over the head by people who live, who can't live in a neighborhood, who can't even park in their own neighborhood, let alone work in a neighborhood. Uh, and that happens, the challenge with respect to the apartment happens to coexist. So um, can I, can, can I ask we, a question? we're prepared to have that conversation with you. Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I, I'm just wondering whether or not we're trying to 
address a problem that can't be addressed in the normal way. And maybe, and I don't know whether or not we can get some feedback from from the board or from Valerie, uh, from Mallory. Um, do you think the teacher will be like, like Thomas Jefferson Hospital does? They have a parking area underneath 95 uh, at Penn's Landing with a shuttle bus that goes back and forth to to the to the hospital. Now, I understand everybody's going to one place, so it's not like you have, you know, 50 schools, 60 schools. But I'm wondering if there's, if there's maybe some pilot programs we could do with remote parking and transportation to the store of the school. And maybe I mean, you guys know the school. You, I'm sure, Mallory, you know the schools that we're talking about better as, as well or better than I do. And maybe there's some remote, remote parking area that we could have teachers park safely and then they all get on the bus and they go to school and the same thing I, after school. Yeah, I very much appreciate that brainstorming. I think that at least, you know, shows the effort to try to solve a problem rather than kind of dismissing an ask that we're trying to ask for. We've heard constantly about this issue. I, I think at this point, and I would default to uh, President Street, but I think at this point, anything is, is worth a try. Um, yeah, anything is worth a try. So thank you so much for offering that. The, the problem is we do not have resources and a budget yeah. to even try a pilot. I mean, but thank you. I appreciate that. I think so, so I was going to leave it alone. But again, um, this is an issue for everybody. And finding a remote parking location for every school not, is not going every to school. be a challenge. I'm just trying to be yeah. real here. Okay. Because some schools but, have parking lots. So, yeah. I mean, you know, you got a school that has a parking lot. You know, they use it where the play, playgrounds used to be. So it is a challenge. And I just want you, I'm not going to sit here and just give, give you a scenario where it's going to be an easy fix. It's just not, right? And we are prepared to work with anybody who's prepared to come up with some solution. But there are other people in the city of Philadelphia that are experiencing similar challenges as it relates to parking. Both in a residential yeah, community, both in a workplace, and the workplace. So most is actually not bad. We would Mr. Take President. Oh, excuse me, everybody. Uh, this is Education Chair Thomas. Please mute yourself. Excuse me, everybody. Hello. Please mute yourself. Can you please mute yourself, whoever? Please, please mute yourself, everyone. Sorry, Council President. Uh, no problem. All right. So um, I'm not going to belabor that issue, but we're willing to, more than willing to help trying to resolve the problem. Um, for all employees, and at the end of the day, we should have safe neighborhoods, so that shouldn't even be a problem, frankly speaking, that people, that's the overall issue, and that's the issue that hopefully we can get to at some point, so it doesn't matter where you park. Um, Mr. President, can I offer a point of view? Yeah, hold on, I'm, I'm going to call, I'm going to be recalling you now. Okay, um, sorry. Yeah, I got the list. Um, uh, Chair recognizes Councilwoman Gautier. Thank you, sorry for that. Okay. Um, I just wanted to mention that we've been dealing with this parking issue, too. Um, last year, we were dealing with this issue with teachers at um, Powell, and we winded up creating a new permit, um, a new city permit uh, for teachers. Um, and so that's legislation that we did, I believe, last session or the session before that could be implemented in other areas. I will say it has not been extremely um, popular, at least it's not yet. Um, we had a lot of back and forth with the admin about the pricing on that permit. Um, and so, um, you know, streets really wanted to make it uh, comparable to a transit pass. So it is $96 a month. Um, but it's comparable to a SEPTA, a SEPTA uh, pass or what um, folks would be paying if they were using SEPTA. And certainly it's legislation that could be changed um, until it, you know, really fits uh, users. So I just wanted to mention that there's already legislation out there that we could take a look at or take another look at that could be implemented at more schools um, than just the one we've implemented it at so far. Thank you, Councilwoman. Chair recognizes Councilman Harry. Thank you, Council President. I I actually just have a, a little statement for Ms. Lopez. Uh, I live a block from Sheridan School. Uh, if your teachers are scared, how do you think my kids feel? Uh, we need to, to, you know, 
I, I get you guys want parking, but we have other issues that we need to deal with, uh, starting with the violence in that neighborhood and what the kids have to see on their way to school. We're traumatizing them right off the bat before they get anywhere. That's a, a K through eighth grade school. Uh, it's atrocious what those kids have to go past on their way to that school. Uh, so I'm sorry. Uh, you know, I get that the teachers need parking and I get that the neighborhood's unsafe. I live there, uh, but we need help to, to clean it up. Thank you. Yeah, I think we're in agreement with all of that. Thank you. Appreciate it. President Clark, can I respond briefly? Yes, please. President. Uh, Mr. Harrity, we definitely understand exactly everything you're saying. And trust me, that's something that weighs heavy as two children who go to public schools as, as well in Philadelphia. But part of our, our superintendent's strategic, uh, not strategic plan, he's trying to trying to implement now to help children right now is to uh, help teacher attendance in schools. And we're really trying to find every single thing in our power to create, to uh, remove all barriers for, for uh, teachers in school. I know he hasn't done his presentation yet. He's going to probably speak about this yet, but, you know, he's... <laughs> Based upon research and the data, children who are educated by, by highly prepared resource teachers who are present more than, I believe, 90 percent of the time, I'm not sure, Dr. Wallace, and you can add that, um, tend to have better outcomes. So, again, we do hear you. We definitely def respect your perspective, and we we, we we champion that as well. But uh, if we didn't advocate for that as well, we wouldn't. I think we wouldn't be doing our due diligence. Um, and I think uh, Board Member Lamb kind of wanted to get in here real quick, um, if possible. I know. Thanks. Thank you, President. Um, Chair, recognize Councilman Squilla. <clears throat> Councilman. Councilman Squilla. Um, okay. Um, I think Board Member uh, Land had our hands raised. No. Did you want to respond to it? Councilman Jones? Yes, Thank you, Mr. President. There must be something wrong <clears throat> with my hand raised feature. But <clears throat> first of all, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, uh, Dr. Watlington and team uh, for your presentation. I want to particularly note for the record Question. the Folks, can the, I ask you all um, to please stay, stay on mute if you're not being called on to speak? Sorry, Councilman. Go ahead. That's all right. Um, I want to thank the uh, school district during the unfortunate closing of Daroff and Bluford, which impacted 1,100 students. There was an all-hands-on-deck effort uh, to address that. I'm going to put a pin in that. But today... A 15-year-old um, was shot on 61st in Nassau on her way to Overbrook High School, my alma mater. We have a process every Monday. Dr. Watlington has been on it where we do roll call check-ins to check the temperature of the area, to utilize cameras that uh, President Clark and other members of council fought for. And <clears throat> I need to, so so we, we've done that maybe seven years ago, and we need, if not now, in this hearing, in future hearings, to know the status of that implementation of safe carters for students in the most persistently dangerous schools. Note, that there are 48 zip codes in the city of Philadelphia. 12 of them are particularly redlined in the sense that they have the vast majority of underperforming schools. In those same 12 zip codes where there are violence, the highest percentage of inmates on state road come from. School to prison pipeline, a real thing. I don't know, they haven't seen in your strategic plan thus far, how we address that. How we look at the causal effects, and it's not all your fault, not at all, but it's all of our responsibility. And you play a key role in that. 
that the kid that cannot read by fourth grade, planners know how many cells to build by the time they're 18, which brings us to learning loss. What was our attainment levels pre-COVID? What was our attainment levels for students during COVID? And what is our attainment recovery, learning loss recovery post-COVID? Because those are the things that I, I care about parking situations. I do. But at the end of the day, we're in the business of educating children. And if we have a 50% dropout rate hovering around that, if we were making donuts and 50% of those times going through that conveyor belt, the donuts failed, we'd be closed. If 50% of the time we couldn't produce a car off of an assembly line, that factory would be closed. So with all due respect to, we're going to go slow on the runway. Every year that we go slow and that step where that school to prison pipeline happens, that's almost irreversible. So it is not your fault, but it is all of our responsibilities. And we have to move faster to stop the bleeding literally and figuratively both in physical violence and in lost generations that don't get the outcomes they're supposed to get. Finally, and I'm going to shut up, but these questions will be asked during budget again. Finally, how do we track those donuts, those cars that we produce, those young people, how do we measure success? Just because you wind up on a college campus does not mean you graduate. How many of our young people wind up in the military? How many of our young people wind up at a wage job that can support themselves and their family? Now think over a four year period and beyond, we should measure that so that we know what we are actually doing. And so in this strategic plan thus far, I mean, I think we need to take a deeper dive to look at those kinds of results. And finally, finally, the Daroff School, which we closed because of a number of things uh, dealing with the responsibilities of the operators, we were also told that the condition of the school was subpar to have children in, subpar to be open. But yet I find out, unbeknownst to any communications to me directly, the council person of that district, that that is a relocation site, a shelter site for people being shipped up from the border. I'm confused. If it's not good enough for our students, how is it good enough for any human being? These are the questions I'm going to need answers to. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you. Thank you. We have some significant issues. Chair recognizes Councilman Squilla. You back. Councilman Squilla. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Um, Real quick, and I just wanted to go back to the parking issue as as we have them in every school, at least in my district. Um, the challenge is, and we need to work together. There's some area schools that don't allow neighbors to park in, in, in the lots after hours and then won't use them because sometimes they need them for recess and other things and then park in the neighborhood and we need to make sure that we're collaborating together with the community organizations that are there and the school so that we work together to come up with a plan. That's the only way this is going to work. Um, because if, if we have adversarial relationships between the community and the schools, 
it just it just won't work. Um, so I'm happy, uh, at least in my district, we, we we work very well together. I mean, we butt heads at times and there's challenges, but as uh, long as that collaboration is there, we can figure out a solution. But I, I don't know if there's going to be one generic solution for every school. Right, Councilman. Um, you're right. Um, at the end of the day, just from my perspective, you have to fix the issue as it relates to crime. I mean, that's the underlying issue. We got to figure that out. You know, we put a lot of money towards this issue. School district has strategies as it relates to, you know, safe carters. We, the city, have put money in for surveillance cameras. Uh, everybody's ready to work, and we got to fix that. And this whole parking thing is is a challenge because of that underlying issue, which is the lack of safety. And people just don't feel safe in neighborhoods. Both teachers, both citizens, both children. We have to fix that. So that's that's going to be a significant part of our focus uh, as we move ahead, uh, particularly President around Clark. schools. President Clark, can um, I respond to something? Uh, that Mr. Uh, that Council Member Jones, some, sure. some of the questions he raised. President Streeter, yeah. Thank you. So thank you for your question. Also, thank you for reor reorienting the con conversation or at least le reminding us not to forget about student success and student outcomes as well. Um, so, but first, I also want to thank you for the, your partnership uh, with Blueford and Daryl for the earlier this year. You were a, a such a huge help um, in helping us to figure out that situation. Um, so, very much, we want to do that on the record as well. But your question about learning loss, yes. So, when we compare ourselves with other school districts, um, the learning loss was not as precipitous. So, there were school districts in urban spaces, suburban spaces, rural spaces had a much deeper decline. And I just wanted to give a, uh, you know, uh, appreciation to the parents, the students, uh, the school district, the teachers who put in that work when everybody was remote and we didn't even know whether the pandemic was ever going to end. So I did want to give you that. I uh, just wanted to give you that update as well. Um, as far as what we're doing now, I believe Dr. Wallinson is going to speak more about this. We can have all the resources we want in the schools uh, that are available, all the, uh, you know, but if, if the students aren't coming to school, if they have low uh, attendance, you can bring a child to the resource, but they, if they if they can't get the resource, they're not they're not learning what they need to learn when they need to learn it. And also, that also applies to teachers. I know it may seem simple to some people, but sometimes we have to do the fundamentals first um, before we can you know move forward with you know the great big grandiose ideas as well. I, mean, I don't want to step on Dr. Watson's uh, feet. I know he was going to want to get to this um, uh, as it relates to you know what his what he's doing for the now. Also, as it relates to safety, yes, um, you know, just today, we whenever there's something that happens in the school, uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Bre Mr. Bethel um, and our school district, we send our resources out to all schools, whether they're charter schools or non charter, non public charter schools as well. We do have the safe path program, so we are moving our resources further and further outside of the school to help support uh, the city um, in its role um, and its responsibility for making sure that our children are safe. But just as a reminder, every time we move resources outside of the school, that's one less resource that we can use uh, to educate our uh, children. So I want to give you those updates as well. I want to address some of those things you said on the record. And thank you personally for your work you did, the yeoman's work you did behind the scenes in the Bluford and Daryl thing uh, situation. Um, and we'll get back to you on those other uh, topics that you asked for. Thank you, President. Um, Chair recognizes is Councilwoman Lazada. Thank you, Council President. I just want to reiterate uh, all of those questions that Councilman Jones uh, just finished mentioning. Um, and I agree with uh, with uh, Councilman Scuola. One, one resolution is not going to solve all. Uh, my district is home to uh, many of the schools who are amongst the lowest performing. And that is not, not only because um, teachers are afraid of coming, uh, but because families are afraid of walking in the neighborhoods. And so I think that, you know, while parking is important for everyone and we need to find a resolution of that, our focus needs to be on how we ensure that our children have a safe uh, and successful academic journey. My children are not getting that. Um, my children have historically not gotten that. And it is not fair. Um, they are living in the epicenter of the opioid crisis. And while it is also a citywide issue, um, it is they are more affected than a lot of other children. Um, families are, are afraid to get them to school. What are we doing to support those families um, 
to get them their children to school? How are we ensuring that they understand that when their children get into that building, they're going to be safe? Um, and there's been a disinvestment in our in our school buildings um, in the seventh council district. And so, you know, what are we doing about that? How is your your request going to support that those schools that are amongst the lowest performing get the necessary resources um, immediately? Um, and and what is different? What are you doing different besides um, uh, in, in this new proposal? What is different than what you're doing what you were doing before uh, to ensure that our kids get uh, what they need to be able to be successful? Thank you. Okay, so to answer your question, what what how, what are we going to do to invest in our students uh, and the divestment to, uh, to students in your district? Um, again, going to have to punt that to Dr. Wellington and his staff um, as it relates to those schools and those and those places. But this board does have a laser focus laser focus on preparing our school district and looking at funding and looking at how we rebuild the district in a way that aligns with the goals and guardrails and student success, student outcomes, and also the makeup of neighborhoods as well. Um, board Member Sally, did you want to um, add something? Yes, and just um, I want to remind us, and it may not be pleasant, and just to try to almost connect the dots from a number of the conversations um, that Dr. Watlington has been helping us to baseline where we are for the first time, right, to understand where we are. I know he set a charge, and I'm sure he'll talk about it in a few minutes for us to become the fastest improving district in the country, but right now in 2022, 84% of our eighth graders could not do math on grade level, right? What the data also says is that when a kid enters the ninth grade and is off grade, they're three times more likely to drop out of school. And the other statistic that Dr. Watlington's initial research has been able to get us, help us get our arms around actually predates the pandemic. So we can't confuse the learning loss from our baseline, which says that for 10 consecutive years, 70% of our kids, right, our, our students, our learners, have not been able to read on grade level. And so good, bad, or ugly, um, in addition to the crime being an issue to address, we have to get back in the business of public education, right, and education in terms of working. And what Dr. Intention, Dr. Watlington's full intention is, and the board, it is our aim to support it, is to take that information and that data to get down to a school by school, if you will, action plan that makes sense. And I think it's really helpful to understand what was described here is that pipeline from school to prison, those 12 zip codes will have an action oriented way um, to begin to be very specific and when you hear me talk about this, it's not just the longer term fix for a sustainable public education for Philadelphia, but it's also the right now, right? So what band-aids, crutches, what temporary solutions do we have to put in play? And with all of that said, I want to thank President Clark for the opportunity to come back with more details. And the comments that I made today, I mentioned this $318 million gap, right? And, and this need to raise funds. As we dig further into and as part of the budget season, we'll look forward to being able to detail that more specifically to be able to move this the, the schools on the improvement path. So if we look at our conversations around goals and guardrails, you can expect us to move from the macro conversation to more detailed, more specific action planning, um, really school by school, and of course, being able to look at it zip code by zip code. So we're going to look forward to being able to come back and talk about the 318 million, as well as all the other supports and collaboration we can do with city council and other elected officials to restore public education in Philadelphia. So I just want to kind of just highlight some of the, this is where we are today. And I'm thankful as harsh as the data is, being able to understand the data and use it to point us, we, get, we can get back on the game of public education and even have some things like intensive tutoring or high dosage Tutoring, tutoring is what Dr. Watlington calls it. We're going to have to invest in something like that in the short term to even help kids in current grades in general. 
And so I know we've got kind of sidetracked on the parking, which is an important piece, but I don't want us to lose sight of one, where we are, and two, the collaboration needed for near-term things and long-term things um, to restore public education in Philadelphia. So thank you for the opportunity to make these comments. Thank you. Yeah, and I think uh, and, and, uh, President Clark, I, I want to get Mallory, Vice President, here real quick, and then Dr. Watlington, if he wants to say this. And I think we, we're kind of starting to get into his territory a little bit. Um, yeah. I think it's important to hear from the board, but I think he's going to give us more substance, some of the stuff that I believe city council members are asking for, yeah. um, and more um, substance. Um, President Streeter, um, that. Real, on, Dr. Mallory, oh, one second. Um, President Streeter, I'm going to we're going to be have after that. Um, we're going to have Councilman Harity and then Councilman Johnson. I'm going to have to jump off for a second. Councilman, uh, the chair of education, will, will be chairing um, uh, when I jump off. Thank you. Be Thank back. you. Keep that. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Watlington with this transition. Is you know I heard a lot of conversation from I think it was Council Member Lozada and others saying. You know, we, you know what's going on in the schools. We need to focus on the education, um, but talking about the violence and the safety outside of the schools and what are we going to do about that. And you know, as I'm hearing that, my question would be, what is City Council also going to do about that and partner with us, right? So for us to be able, and for Dr. Watling to be able to laser focus on what's happening in the schools and the academic portions of it, we need the support and to work with the city to help us with what's going on outside of the schools. We heard President Streeter say every resource we take out of a school to work on something outside means that we're not putting it into student success. So Dr. Wellington's gonna talk a lot about that, but the partnership of us, we focus on inside, obviously some goes out, but then the question would be is what is the city doing to make that safe travel to school happening? So Dr. Wellington can be successful inside the schools. Thank you for that comment. Um, I'm gonna be taking over as chair. Let me just provide a, a little bit of clarity. Um, first of all, um, we're, we're not gonna go to the superintendent yet. There are other council members who are in the queue who have questions mm -hmm. for school board members. Um, that did not get a chance to answer. I know council president said council member Harity, but council member Harity, we have other council members who haven't spoken for the first time yet. So we're gonna allow them to speak first. We're gonna allow you to go second and then we'll go from there. I'm also gonna implement a five minute limit as it relates to comments as well as questions so that everybody gets an equal opportunity to communicate their concerns to the district um, as well as to the school board. Uh, so with that being said, chair recognizes council member Johnson then we'll go council member Gilmore Richardson, and then I'll close out the first round myself. Then I'll pass it to council member Harity for a second round. And if there are no other members in for a second round, then we'll transition to our superintendent, uh, council member Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first and foremost, I wanna uh, congratulate uh, Reginald Streeter for becoming president of the board. I wanna also congratulate my constituent, Mallory, uh, Lopez also for becoming a uh, vice chair. And as always, it's good to see um, Dr. Wallington. And so um, to all the members of the board, uh, thank you for taking time out of your schedule and being here. Um, just a couple brief questions. One, in response to, because it seems like this is a, I'm just kind of getting the vibe. It's like us versus them type of conversation going on. So I just want to, one, reach out and say that around what can council do as part of the Special Committee on Gun Violence, I will be inviting uh, Dr. Wallington uh, and his team uh, in a roundtable discussion around how we can collaborate better around particular the issue of gun violence. So um, that invitation um, will be forthcoming with other city agencies as well, particularly around um, keeping our young people safe. Um, but a couple brief questions I want to get to the, to the bottom of. Uh, one, my, my, my heart kind of fell when I listened to the numbers that Lisa uh, just talked about, um, the lack of achievement in terms of reading with our young people. And I remember, Reginald, when you became the president or when you was going through the interview process, you talked about um, the conspiracy to kill black boys, right? Basically, the book by, say the brother name, Kwai. Jawaza Kanjufu. Thank you. And so, but this is a 10-year process that was just mentioned, where with a 74% young people not on the reading level. So I just want to get a better understanding on, because um, I hear about the three, I think it's $319 million budget. And every time I've been in council in my last 10 years, and even as a state rep, we've always made sure the district got their proper amount of funding. Always, right? But we've never seen them, the, the needle move, to be quite frank with you, in terms of achievement. 
of our young people? And that's the question that we hear when we talk about our constituents, especially around the issue of taxes, right? They say, okay, well, you want us to reduce the homestead exemption, right? And we're about to lose our, lose our homes in gentrified neighborhoods for the schools, which I say, okay, no problem. We got to take care of our kids. But at the same time, what's the return on investment in terms of moving that needle um, forward? So I'm, hopefully as we go forward, I want to see a better um, read. The, is something going to be different about how we educate our young people? Because for some reason, we keep coming back to the same place over and over with whoever the superintendent is with basically to be up front with you achievement level where young people aren't really accomplishing what I believe that they should be accomplishing. So and we'll do the funding, hopefully on the state level to help you advocate for um, a fair funding formula, right? But we keep investing money, 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 money. But at the same time, it seems like the expectations and how young people are achieving in terms of reading and math I just haven't seen the, the needle move. So hopefully Dr. Wilds can get a, a deeper dive into what his plan is going to be around the guardrails and really zeroing on that issue. And then also, what's our role to act? What are we going to be doing from the district standpoint to engage parents? When Dr. Ackerman was here, God bless her soul, one of her hallmarks that I, I do give her credit around was engaging parents, making sure that parents were an integral part of whatever the district was actually doing. I remember she brought Les Brown in because she understood that some parents are operating at a certain level, but it's probably one of the highest turnout events that we've had in the city when it comes to partnering with the school district of Philadelphia because she understood that you had to uplift the parents as well because they weren't at the same level as, um, I guess, interacting with other individuals in terms of how they were educating their children and taking care of their children, but they showed they care by showing up. So that's my other question. And then last but not least, um, one of the board members early on, I think it was you, Sarah, talked about uh, well, we want the city to do more around mental health and trauma and so forth, and we've already implemented those things in the district. So I just want to know, what's the actual things that have, besides the rapid response team, what are we doing around trauma-informed support services? I did get a brief idea from Karen Lynch and talking to Captain Bethel some time ago, but I want to be supportive of helping our young people who are going to school um, basically shocked and sh shell shocked because not just being shot, but their friends being murdered, their family members being murdered, and they and they also are going to going to school trying to learn under all the stress and pressure of living in neighborhoods where people are dying day in and day out. So it's what trauma support services are we doing? What parental engagement are we doing? And what what are we going to do differently to reduce? those numbers of young people not achieving and when it comes to reading and math. So I know that was a lot, but mm -hmm. those are three things though, because there is a direct correlation. I think Councilman Jones talked about it. If I can't read, right, then I'm going to speak, I'm going to be the guy that's probably going to be the class clown in class where I'm not going to go to school. If I don't go to school, I'm going to hustle. If I ain't hustling, I'm on the corner. I'm going to do other things that's unbecoming you know, a good citizen in our community. So those are the three core areas that I have an interest in partnering with the district about, as well as highlighting the things that we're doing from the council and city side. Thank you. Thank you. And now just to respond, I'm going to respond briefly. I'm going to, I'm going to ask board uh, member Wilkerson to uh, chime in here as well. Um, I think, I think, so when we look at the data, it looks like COVID really hurt a lot. We were actually making strides as a district you know but then if you look wait, at the wait, data it comes down i, I mean, I, it, I don't mean to cut you off reginald yeah but lisa said i'm mean, gonna be up front with you lisa kind of clarified that now nah, we ain't just focusing on covid this been going on before covid before your watch bro. Underst so understood understood i'm just adding clarify that because i'm gonna let you I, go ahead and talk i understood and i'm just adding i'm just adding context as well yes the pre-existing numbers weren't the numbers that any of us should be looking at ourselves and say we did a good job, right? I get that. But um, I just wanted to put that into context that, yes, COVID did happen and it did have an impact on learning loss. And again, as I said earlier, if you look at the data as it relates to other big cities, urban spaces, places that have more resources per child, um, the learning loss was not as bad as other places. I think that, look, I'm not saying we won the game like we done, could take our ball home when we were done. But I'm just saying, I think that that I think that means something, right? Um, as well. 
Number two, um, I think, yes, it is important to think about um, student outcomes and those numbers, which we have a laser focus on as well, but we're looking at also a multivariate approach of giving our children what they need. I know a uh, council president um, and our superintendent were at Strawberry Mansion um, introducing a pilot program. We can have actual relationships with the unions and things like that. So students can graduate from high school and have a job making $40,000 a year, $50,000 a year, right? Again, I'm not saying woohoo, good for us, it, it but that's something that we're doing as well. Can I respectfully just inter, inter, interject? Just so you know, and I think everybody council person on this call knows that, you know, you know, and and kudos to, to the building trades, and I support them, and I support Ryan Boy and so forth. But you know, also that you know, if 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 the kids can't read and write, oh yeah, oh, yeah. An apprenticeship test, and and they oh, yeah. know that. To be quite frank, that's what they respond and say. Well, they say, well, they can't read and write, so that's why our numbers are down. So I say we have to figure out ways. To help them get there so they can pass that test right. so they can do the reading and the math as opposed to throwing it up in our hands and say well they can't pass the reading and, and writing therefore we're not increasing our numbers around diversity and inclusion so i just wanted to add that yeah, yeah, to yeah. that conversation yeah much appreciated and like we we get we definitely understand that and again i think try not to step on dr watlington's presentation or what his staff would have to put more meat in the bone but there is an understanding of professional development for for the teachers who do, do teach the cte courses so they can understand the pedagogical approach of how to teach a child the uh the the academics pieces as it relates to just in, in addition to the trade piece right so we, we we're, we're aligned on that point um as it relates to engaging a parent right now the board is looking to uh through our uh to uh, board member uh, Cecilia Thompson, who um, is who helps to direct the uh, PCAT group, which for many don't know, under the, under the, uh, the city charter, uh, the Board of Education has to have a parent advisory group, right? And we're trying to right now give them the laser focus they need and the resources they need and the and the parameters they need so that they can be an even better tool of engaging with parents. And I mean, I'm not saying that's the end all be all, but this is something that is percolating within the board itself. We are self aware of engaging with parents. Um, and as far as city and mental health supports, again, I think that's something that Dr. Wallington can speak more to as well. And then uh, President Wilkerson, if you can kind of chime in on this thank topic. You. And Mr. No, Chair, Mr. That, Chairman, Mr. Chairman, I, I, know, I know he's going to wrap me up, Mr. Chairman. Yep. One last part, if you don't mind, if you could just give me a small latitude. And one last part, are we addressing cultural competency when it comes to teachers that are teaching our children. I know Councilman Thomas and myself and Sharif Almecki has an interest in adding more African-American male teachers in the classroom, but even beyond the African-American male teachers in the classroom, because education has changed based upon our environment, is there any interest or any focus around cultural competency in teaching our young people who are actually learning in like a shell-shocked environment coming from our neighbors dealing with gun violence and so forth in areas of poverty? That's, and that's my last question. Mr. Chairman. And Joyce? Yeah, Board President, anyone want to respond to that briefly? Maybe a 30 second response so we can move on to the next council member. Yeah, I just I just wanted to say briefly that that this is the right conversation for us to be having, the right questions for you to be asking. Why is it that after more than a decade our children aren't learning? Um, it's the reason that the board adopted its goals and guardrails and found that we were the second lowest performing school district in the country, that we as a board spent less than 10% of our time talking about student achievement, that one of the things you'll hear from Dr. Watlington is we, we don't have the right curriculum, we don't teach, we don't support teachers uniformly, we don't put our strongest teachers in the most challenging situations, and we don't focus. Um, I, I, I think we are now asking the right questions because our children have the ability to achieve at high levels, but we as adults are going to have to change. We're going to have to do things differently. We're going to have to be together in focusing on a strategy. So I'm delighted. These are tough questions. It's, you know, I'm sitting up here squirming. I've been on the board for six years. <laughs> You know, but these are the right questions that we have to ask and answer if our children are going to have the kind of opportunity they deserve. And I'm excited to have Dr. Watlington to have an outsider's perspective on why it is that we haven't been able to deliver for our children. And I think, you know, when we pivot to him, you're going to hear some very basic stuff. It's not glamorous. 
you know, we don't, we aren't doing the basics right. And, and so I'm excited about the new leadership. I'm excited to have Reginald Streeter at the helm. I'm excited to have Dr. Watlington. I'm, I'm excited about the board's focus and the asking the tough questions, because that's the only way we're going to get um, success for our children. And with that, I'll be quiet. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Thank you for your response. Council member, thank you for your questions. Chair recognizes Council member Gilmore Richardson. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Chair. And thank you to Board Chair uh, Streeter and all of the board members present, uh, Dr. Watlington and uh, all of the school district uh, personnel who are here. Um, Mr. Chair, I have a number of things that I'd like to get on the record for this first round. And uh, maybe possibly in the second round, uh, we can hear uh, additional feedback from uh, the board, uh, particularly Board Chair Streeter and the other members of the board. But I think it's important, uh, not only as an at-large member of council, uh, but also as a, a school district graduate and a mother of three current students at two different school district schools uh, to get all of this on the record uh, with the time that I have allotted. So first, I wanted to circle back to, and I've been taking copious notes around all of the things that have been mentioned, but I wanted to circle back to one of the board members' uh, testimony about the need for enforcement uh, around the curfew. And I just wanted to put on the record um, that uh, we have uh, worked with the Department of Human Services and uh, PPD to uh, put out two additional RFPs uh, that will be due in the coming weeks uh, to establish two additional uh, community evening resource centers uh, in our Northeast Division, uh, which is the 2nd, 7th, 8th, and 15th Police District, and also the East Division, which has uh, been talked about uh, for quite some time during this hearing, uh, which encompasses uh, the police districts of the 24th, the 25th, uh, and the 26th Police District. So we anticipate by this summer, we will have six community evening resource centers uh, up and running in every police district division in this city um, that will be open every single day from 7 p.m. to 2 a.m. for our young people to go to voluntarily or involuntarily. So that's the first thing I wanted to get on the record because that was mentioned as a part of uh, the testimony. Uh, the next thing I wanted to uh, start with, and I'll go back to where uh, CP sort of started in talking about the federal dollars and the infusion of federal dollars and how uh, that enabled all of us uh, to really weather the storm of COVID-19 and its potential financial impact um, for the school district and also for the city. But I want to pivot uh, specifically to enrollment. Um, if we could get an answer around the enrollment uh, for this current school year, um, how that differs uh, from the projected enrollment uh, for this school year. Uh, we know that we anticipate additional challenges uh, around um, the out years of the five-year plan around revenue. And so we wanted to talk about, and I wanted to specifically talk about enrollment because that'll lead into my next set of questions. And then I wanted to also uh, focus on, uh, and one of the members talked about uh, the staffing constraints and uh, not having a fully staffed uh, school district. And again, I think that goes back to uh, the enrollment uh, and the enrollment projections and sort of the reality around enrollment, which ultimately for me goes back to um, the, the issue that I have uh, spoken to the district about for uh, several years now regarding the school finder application uh, on your website and how families are not being routed to uh, the proper public schools, which I believe uh, is dramatically impacting uh, our enrollment uh, for our schools. Um, and I've sent the district uh, proof of this. Um, I did let you all know in advance that I would be bringing this up at this hearing because I have uh, tried to work with you all on this issue um, for the past several years. I was told last week that the issue was corrected. I went back to the site and the issue has not been corrected. And I do believe that this issue of uh, not routing families to the proper public school is the reason why our enrollment projections are off, which then impacts the staffing that we have for our school. So I would like the data on uh, 
projected enrollment versus actual enrollment for this year and the coming years. I also wanted to uh, talk about very briefly the learning loss um, and young people reading on grade level, particularly around um, and after uh, COVID-19. Um, one specific program that I could point to that I thought was very successful um, that was happening on the ground in the district was the AARP uh, reading program where they brought in retired teachers uh, to sit and help the young people learn uh, to read better and to have more of an opportunity um, to, outside of just the class some environment in school um, to, to read more. That program has been uh, dissolved and taken out of the school. I know that my daughter and my son attend and I'm sure all the other schools. So I wanted to put that on the record and I will come back on the second round since I have one minute left. Um, and the last thing I, I wanted to mention was how we are supporting our administrators uh, across the district, recognizing uh, that they have a lot of young people who have been impacted uh, by gun violence. Um, what are the exact supports um, for administrators and for teachers and the school staff uh, around that issue? I wanted you all to get that on the record as well. So that's all I have for this round since I have one minute left, but I would like responses to uh, those issues that I brought up, particularly around the data for the enrollment, um, around your projected revenue um, in the out years of your plan, um, the, the staffing challenges, um, and what you're doing to, to rectify that, and then we'll go from there. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, you're on mute. I, I was thanking you and hoping that uh, we could get a response to some of the issues that you could communicate it. And um, just to let folks know that um, I'll, I'll be going next and we'll close out the first round with Council Member Phillips and then we'll move on to the second round of questions. Yeah, so um, as it relates to some questions that um, are probably more uh, the, the school, school district and uh, uh, superintendent should respond to. Um, I don't know if you want to respond to it now or, or we can do it with when you um when it's, I mean, after your presentation. President so Schrader, if you could things. just pin those questions, if you could just let us know, like I, I hear a staffing question, I figured that would be our superintendent. Yep. So if you yep. could just answer the questions that specifically apply to the school district, I'll make sure that my colleague comes back around when the school district does. I'm sorry, if you can answer the questions that the specifically board. go to the school board, um, I'll yep. make sure that my colleague comes back around when we do the school district. Thank you. First, I want to say thank you for uh, letting us know about the work that's being done uh, to help with the issue of curfews um, and the resource uh, uh, centers that you mentioned where students can be, free to, well, our learners can be between the hours of 7 p.m. and 2 a.m., I believe. So thank you for, uh, that was very helpful for us to know that there is work being done at City Council on the on this issue. Um, and as it relates- of information, I just yes. wanted to share that that information has been shared on the ground with the schools in those areas. And now that the other divisions will be added, the same will happen. I don't want anyone to take away from this public hearing that this is the first time that you all are hearing about that. We have shared that information and we will continue to share it. I just wanted to say that for the record. And I just wanted to affirm you and say, we really appreciate you. <laughs> so, um, in addition to that, um, I think, as far as the projected revenue piece, um, you know, we see a, a, a cliff, a fiscal cliff happening at, uh, for the year 2025. And I think what reorients me, like, well, well, what's going on here is when you have 60 cents on a dollar already, right, you're, you're kind of already in a hole. And we're always feeling like we have having a rob Peter to pay Paul. So we're always appreciative of the federal dollars and city council dollars. And I think the, the district can respond more. Uh, explicitly about what exactly that looks like. But I just wanted to say that for the record and tee that for, for, for Dr. Wallington when it's time um, to for him to speak. Um, how we're supporting administrators. So, I mean, I'm not I'm, I'm not going to say everything that we're doing, but I think it's important for me to raise that the board uh, authorized and uh, voted on and approved uh, mental health supports for our staff. So we're not just looking at the mental health of our students. Um, we're also looking at the mental health supports for our staff and our teachers and things like that. So um, I, I'm just going to leave it at that. And I believe Dr. Wallington, your staff can answer the rest of the questions. Uh, yeah, yes, sir, Mr. Uh, President Streeter and uh, 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 Chair Thomas, uh, I will, I've made a note of the actual enrollment numbers. We'll follow up very quickly, expeditiously to get that uh, uh, since it's on the record. Also, I did hear uh, Council Member Gilmore Richardson's concern about a routing issue that you brought up previously that was not corrected. Uh, we'll give that immediate attention and follow up. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Wallington. Uh, and I will again continue to work with the officials at the district on this matter. Um, I've even had the team rephrase the, the wording that we've sent over to you all for the past several years seeking to get this issue rectified. Obviously, this is before your time, but I do think this issue is uh, really, um, it is really affecting the enrollment for our schools, which then impacts the revenue that you all receive at the district, which then impacts the staffing for the schools. And I know it probably sounds like a minuscule issue, but it's not. It is one of the most important issues that the district must address over the last several years. And Dr. Watlington, I will be honest with you and, and I will not mince my words. I am very uh, happy that you were there and in leadership uh, in the district, but you have changed. Not very much um, under you has changed. And so we're still dealing with the same folks who don't believe this is an issue. So I'm going to put that on the record publicly, because if they thought that it was an issue from an administration perspective, they would have corrected this years ago. And so I want to put that on the record. I'm very happy that you were there to have a different perspective on what this issue could be. But while you are new, a lot of the same folks underneath that you are the same. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Colin. Really um, before, before we get ready to transition to the second round, I just want to uh, put a couple of things on the record um, from my perspective, as well as uh, some issues that I have. Number one, um, in the midst of the presentation today, I was really disappointed not to hear anything um, as it relates to the individual black charter institutions that have communicated a number of different concerns to the district. Um, we were supposed to get a report last fall. That didn't happen. We were supposed to get a report in January. That didn't happen. And for that not to be mentioned at all in the entire presentation, is similar to the concerns that's been communicated that that specific demographic of black led institutions uh, feel forgotten about. Um, I also uh, wanted to communicate my disappointment as it relates to listening to this issue around parking and parking spaces. Um, we are in a dialogue on a consistent basis uh, to hear a board member say that we, if we can't figure out the parking situation for teachers, we're doomed. Um, if the issue was that critical to the point where as though it could make or break the success of our schools, I was, I'm wondering, are there a list of schools? When I think about Martin Luther King High School or Frankfurt High School or Washington High School or Northeast High School, um, I don't know any of those schools that have these parking issues. I'm not saying that they don't exist across the city, but if this issue is that prevalent and that important and it could make or break the success of our schools, I'm wondering, are there a list of schools that we have where we have this parking crisis uh, so we could begin a brainstorm exactly what we can do about that because unfortunately outside of a few isolated incidents this is the first that i'm hearing that this is this serious of a crisis that it could make or break our schools uh so um that would be very much appreciated um you also mentioned the 325 million dollars in federal stimulus money that's looking to address infrastructure and you also talked about uh, six years uh, in two billion dollars worth of infrastructure dollars being spent to address some of the capital issues that we have in our school. Um, I know that you've communicated this information for the record for city council members, but I think that it's important that you communicate this information to the general public today as it relates to uh, specifically what we're looking to do with those dollars, how it's going to be spent. And of course, what I've been pushing and challenging on is not just the plan, but also ensure uh, encouraging local investment. So as we're spending $6 billion that we're prior prioritizing Philadelphia-based businesses and Philadelphia-based companies and black and brown-based businesses as it relates to who get those procurement opportunities. Um, last but not least, um, I do think that it's appropriate to communicate to the public uh, something around what's going on with the lawsuit. Um, clearly, uh, from, from a legal purpose, you can't communicate certain things, uh, but I think that that is... Um, the the what is it, the something in the room, the elephant in the room um, that a lot of people in the general public are concerned about. Um, so I do think it's important that before we move on to uh, the superintendent and listen to his presentation, that there's some level of communication around the lawsuit, um, your concern around the lawsuit, some of the issues that we have on our side with facilities and what you're hoping to get out of uh, what we're doing, because we're all extremely concerned over our facilities. And as I've stated to a couple of you off the record, um, I do think that um, this lawsuit creates some perception issues, and I also think that we didn't get the proper amount of time to negotiate an effective way to essentially handle this. Uh, so I'll stop right there. I look forward to mm -hmm. answers.
to some of the things that I just suggested. Uh, but if I cut you off, I'm going to apologize for that because I have to lead by example with this five minute time limit. Got you. So um, as it relates to the lawsuit, as you know, we can't really speak too much to the uh, to the lawsuit. But um, I, I, as I've mentioned um, before in public, that the board is interested in the settlement of such. Um, our concerns are laid out um, in the in the media, but I mean, you know, uh, they're also laid out in the complaint as well. Um, but I do want to say again, the board is, is happy and willing. The district is happy and willing to to continue the negotiations. Um, in order to uh, come to some resolution so that we all can be on the same page as well. Um, as it relates to um, the parking issue, I think what, what might have happened was we felt stymied when we heard in public last year. And again, I'm not trying to castigate or blame, make blame. Um, good luck with that, right? I think when, when we hear that, um, it, it kind of stymied us, but what maybe we felt hopeless. Not hopeless, but there's nothing that we can do. So yes, we can be better uh, going forward. At least I, as the board president, could be better going forward. Um, communicating such uh, issues that are germane, uh, irrespective of what uh, someone says in public as well. I'm sorry, excuse me. I'm um, sorry, quick, uh, Mr. President. The, the the concern. Good luck with that. I thought that that was something that just happened today. No, it happened last year. Last year when we uh, came before uh, City Council, one of our biannual meetings. That uh, that's something that we heard. So, um, that I, that was yeah. Let me just put it on the record that when, when from the context of what I heard today and from the context last year, uh, that seemed like it was a, a joking response. It, it didn't seem like it was realistically we're not going to do anything about it. And I also want to put on the record to the public mm -hmm. that we're in constant communication with the school district and the school board. We meet on a monthly basis. And again, that was never an issue that was communicated uh, to this council body. And this is um, something that, um, you know, if it's as serious as. Um, it could make or break our schools and we could be doomed if we don't fix it. Um, this legislative body and the education committee, especially, specifically under my leadership, uh, will do everything in our power to make sure our schools aren't doomed. So we really I just want to put that oh, on yeah. the record, President Street. Oh, yeah, and, 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 yeah, me saying I wasn't trying to say any of those things, try to say those, what you're saying, what you said was, wasn't fair or accurate. I just I was just trying to you know frame for we did ask for it before and we did raise it. Um, but again, like I, we will do better going forward with bringing things up again and again, even if they're not. And it also was a part of a, gr a group of ask. It wasn't, that, that wasn't the whole presentation. I think the parking issue has kind of, in this space, um, taken taken um, kind of the, the air out of the room. There are other things that we asked for as well. But again, we're looking forward going forward to partnering with the district, partnering with the Ed Committee, um, and you know finding some extra time in addition to those times to communicate so we can be fully aligned. Um, as it relates to oh the charter school uh, is black charter school issue count that as a uh, please count that against the head not the heart um i'll give a brief update uh so one of the uh, drawbacks of being um under resourced for years and not blaming anyone is that we have some old antiquated uh technology and as an attorney when you're doing discovery it could be very hard and onerous to get documents i um, mean things like that if you don't have updated IT and updated technology and things like that. So you can do Boolean search. A Boolean search is if you, you go on Google and you say um, you're looking for T-shirts within two words of another word, and then all the emails or all the documents will come up with things that are within those two words and things like that. So having those kind of uh, those uh, technological um, drawbacks have created an unintended consequence of slowing down um, the mechanism and ways in which the uh, the uh, the uh, independent investigator can do their work. Um, but with that being said, we have given tens of thousands of documents, uh, some of the old fashioned way in boxes, um, you know, doing searches the old fashioned way. We put a lot of resources behind um, trying to get this done as fast as possible. So just speaking for myself, I would love to get this done as fast as possible. But I would love for it to be done um, in the best way possible. But in addition to that, it is independent. So I can't give any updates on the, the investigation is heading this way or this is what they're finding. It is truly um, the Board of Education truly wanted it to be an independent investigation. We're not putting our fingers on the dial and trying to dictate what the outcomes are, but we are kind of hamstrung by some uh, issues that are outside of our, con our control as well. So we apologize um, if you know we're not getting the report out. Or, well, it's not enough to get a report out for us not be able to have the documents, but we are kind of hampered by our technological uh, disadvantages of, of source. Sure. But, so, Mr. Yes, President, sir. because I'm out of time, we'll talk about capital in a, a six a billion dollars. I mean, a six year, two billion dollar investment a little bit later in our conversation. Uh, the one thing I will say for the record is um, because of these delays, we're going to look to have this conversation hopefully next mm -hmm. month as it relates to a council hearing and put ourselves in a position to, to begin to uh, move this conversation to a public platform because uh, we're really disappointed 
and the fact that uh, this information was supposed to be communicated last summer. Um, and then again last fall, and then again earlier this year, and now it's being pushed back to the spring. And I'm not pointing any fingers or any blame, but what I do know is that the public need answers. I'm also going to be looking forward to a list of schools um, that have these issues around parking so we can begin to do a deep dive around what it is that we need to do to address that issue because we don't want our schools to be doomed. With that being said, I will pass it to Council Member Phillips so Council Member Phillips can close out the first round of questions. And then after that, we'll begin the second round of questions and we'll start with Council Member Harity and then Council Member Gilmore Richardson. Uh, Council colleagues, please put in a chat feature if you wish to be teed up for a second round. And after the second round of questions, we'll move on to our superintendent in the next part of our presentation. Uh, Chair recognizes Council Member Phillips. Hi, thank you, Chairman Thomas. Appreciate your facilitation of this meeting. The question, so recently I've been visiting schools in the Ninth District and among, during my time uh, visiting the schools, I've learned that um, some of our area high schools have um, a dearth of advanced placement classes um, in our schools. And so as a educator, former educator, and also a college access professional, uh, where I've helped a number of students get into uh, colleges debt free, um, advanced placement courses, specifically AP courses, are very important uh, for some of our uh, students to be able to, if who are interested in going to college, um, to be able to attain uh, a college education debt free because most of the schools, including some of our uh, schools, most of our schools that have large endowments, even schools that don't have large endowments, want top tier um, students. And thus far, um, you know, there's many schools here in the city of Philadelphia that have two, three, you know, AP courses and comparable to some other districts who have 10, 20, 15 AP courses. Um, so that's an, and that's also important for the equitable plan, Phil. And also, what are we doing from a district level uh, to really helping our students attain um, more uh, CTE opportunities as well um, at every single high school. I know that's been brought up, but I just want to you know, be on the record to talk about that as well. Thank you. Uh, just as a quick response, um, I think um, even though the adults have failed for, all, for uh, outcomes to show that our students are all top tier, I think every single student in our school district, every single learner is top tier, and I know you believe that as well. But um, just to add some context, so uh, because of the lack of resources, um, you know, some of the other barriers that we have, we are trying to think outside the box. So I'm going to give a shout out to PFT for allowing us to um, do a pilot program where we can have for now until we get the resources necessary um, to, to allow virtual virtual AP courses being taught across schools. Right. I mean, I know that's not the best. We all understand in-person learning is the best, but we're trying our best to figure out our way through this. Um, with the uh, with some of the uh, this some of the uh, barriers that we have as a school district as well. So big shout out to that. So and I think that hope. I mean, I know that's not the answer you want. Um, that's not the uh, the magic fix. But I wanted you to know that that's something we think about, right? I think um, if I sat here and I had nothing to say about it, you know, it might be like, wait, this this is something that you know the district is thinking about. We definitely think about AP courses and things like that, and making our neighborhood comprehensive high schools have access to the same things that I had access to when I was in Germantown, like when I went to Germantown High School, where we had cities and schools, and we had law and government, junior Air Force ROT, so whatever you wanted, you can get at the high school. Um, and um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very appreciative, and I think Dr. Wallington is getting us back on the pathway where um, no matter what school you go to, you can get baseline, you know, quality education where you can be able to get to certain schools where the AP courses. Um, and as, as it relates to what you were saying, what are we doing more for the college prepare uh, readiness? Um, I think that's a, a kind of a question that Dr. Wallington and his staff can answer, but I wanted to put some context to your question, uh, Council Member Phillips. And President Street, if I may just add, uh, 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 Council Member Thomas, uh, you know, in my listening and learning tour, a student told me that she had one advanced placement course offered in her high school, whereas we have lots of schools. We have other schools that have a lot more AP courses. As a part of our strategic plan work, we fully intend to set a baseline that all schools in the school district of Philadelphia will have a certain range and number of advanced placement courses for equity purposes. And so uh, you can count on us for that. More to come. Thank you so much, Dr. Walton and uh, Board President Streeter. Uh, that's what I wanted to hear. Uh, and yes, for the record, I do agree that all students uh, are are strong and excellent in their own right. So 
Uh, with that being said, thanks, uh, uh, Council Member Thomas. Back to you. Thank you, Council Member. Um, we're moving on to the second round. Chair recognizes Council Member Harity. Yeah, um, you know, just to start off with a, a, a fact that uh, there have been studies that something as simple as a new school could bring up grade point averages itself. Uh, go segmenting into my questions, I see in your your total capital investment plan of that two million dollars, you have a list underneath there where it said uh, current projects, and you had new construction. I'd like to know uh, how many new buildings are we, schools are we talking about uh, and where are they going to be deployed uh, with the with keeping in mind that uh, if we are going to be building new schools, maybe we should start in the neighborhoods where the grades are lower than others. Uh, and try to uh, give these kids a sense of pride and, uh, you know, just feel safe in a new, clean, state-of-the-art school. Uh, just wondering about that. Thank you. Um, thank, thank you, uh, Council Member Harity. And I, uh, again, this is a question that I think uh, the district will probably give you more of a substantive answer. Um, but what I will say is, you know, I, our thinking, and I, I feel safe saying this on the board, is that, yes, we want to rebuild the district as well. Um, and, you know, you know, for example, we have uh, a lot of excitement about Cassidy and what it's going to bring and how that can maybe change the narrative of how sometimes we're so att attached to buildings um, that we don't think about what could be possible if we, if we actually were to tear down a building that has a lot of love and respect from the community, but we rebuild something brand new. So this is something that we're thinking about. And I know Dr. Wallington is going to talk about, or he may talk about how we're trying to align that with our academic goals um, in a way so that, you know, some schools say if you want to do more CTE things, right, you may have to build a school in a different way than you would if you didn't, right? So that's all part of the process as well. But I wanted to put that context on top of it. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm going to, uh, you know, Dr. Wallington, when his time comes up, if he wants to do that now, he can uh, discuss the, uh, the particulars of your question, uh, Mr. Mr. Harity. Superintendent, you're on mute. Oh, thank you, uh, 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 Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. President, uh, I'd like to answer that question during my time. During the presentation, I will have uh, COO Reggie McNeil, who will give a very clear, short update on new construction projects that are in the works. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Harrity, um, were there any other questions for you? No, I'm just uh, interested in hearing where they are going to plan on building and uh, how soon we can look forward to uh, our kids having someplace safe and and someplace they can actually learn that isn't more like a prison. Thank you, Council Member Harity. Um, Board President Streeter and the entire team, I just want to thank you for taking the time to be here with us this morning. Thank you for your service for the city of Philadelphia. Uh, while we do have... Um, a lot of passion as it relates to these type of dialogues. I just want to communicate for the record that being a school board member is a volunteer position and all of the people who are on the call today um, are choosing to be here. They're choosing to sacrifice their time, uh, sacrifice um, opportunities they can be spending with their family, friends, building professional careers uh, to invest in our children. So um, what you hear today as it relates to the general public listening to our dialogue is a bunch of folks who care a bunch of folks who are willing to serve and people who have stepped up to the plate and said that they will be committed to our children. We all have different visions as it relates to the direction our school should go in and we're all going to advocate in different ways. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, it's imperative that we recognize that you are doing this on a voluntary basis and we appreciate the work that you're doing, President Streeter, as well as the entire team over at the school board. So I do want to say thank you. Uh, clearly, we all have concerns. Clearly, we all have a lot more work to do. But at the end of the day, um, we have to let you know that we appreciate your service as well as the other members of the school board. Thank you, and we appreciate you. And I know contrary to what it may look like on the outside, I'm, I'm speaking um, and I feel very confident about that the board really wants to partner and be have a symbiotic relationship with the city. Um, local control just started up again, and I think that we are all working through the growing pains of doing that, but I'm committed 
as board chair to facilitate a relationship that uh, that um, cr that creates a perception that I think of what the uh, realities are that we need you. And I hope that we can evolve to a space where everyone feels that we are needed as well so that we can do what's in the best interest of our children. So I'm looking forward to working with you, working with whoever want to work with us to, uh, to do what's best for our children. I, and I believe I speak for the board in, in, that, in agreement with that and un un unanimity. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm assuming that there are no other comments from members of the school board as well as uh, my council colleagues. So with that being said, uh, Mr. Superintendent, I will pass it to you and your team so you can begin your presentation. Uh, council colleagues, as you're listening to the presentation, I'm sure you'll have questions. Please use the chat feature to mention your questions. I already see Council Member Gilmore Richardson has questions for the superintendent. Um, we are going to commit to the five minute limit for this next uh, round of questions. And uh, Mr. Superintendent, I'll pass it to you and I look forward to the dialogue. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Thomas. I want to say good morning to you again, as well as President Streeter and Vice President Fix Lopez and all council members and board members. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here today. Uh, I want to uh, begin uh, on the next slide by uh, just talking very quickly. I'll take about 10 minutes and we'll be happy to take any questions. Uh, about our vision for the school district. We are laser focused in the school district on achieving the board's goals and guardrails and to also position our school district to become the fastest improving large urban school district in the country. What does that actually mean? Uh, th there is uh, uh, certainly the board goals and guardrails relate to state assessments. We can also compare ourselves to other large urban districts by looking at uh, NAIC performance, which, which is the nation's report card. It's administered in all 50 states, Washington, D.C., Puerto Rico, and 26 urban school districts. And we're certainly one of those 26 urban districts. So we ought to be comparing ourselves to ourselves. Are we getting better on the one hand in the state uh, performance and local performance indicators? And then compare it to 26 other national urban districts. Uh, we want to look at NAIC performance and reading and math. That assessment is given every two years. We want to look at four-year gradu graduation rates and our dropout rates. So that's how we would uh, measure that over time. On the next slide, uh, former board president Wilkerson talked a little bit about the goals and guardrails. I put this slide in here because this is so, so, so critically important. I think the Board of Education did really significant work to create the goals and guardrails. Two, the board does significant work because at every meeting, the board is progress monitoring how, what are we doing and are we getting better in each of these areas. That's very different than a lot of school boards, urban or non-urban across the country. And so we're spending the time on the stuff that matters. We are developing accountability structures, both for the superintendent and my staff and all the employees in the school district. Now, um, there were some conversations among council members about where are we academically, so I want to put that in context. Uh, on the one hand, when you look at the National Association of Education Progress, the nation's report card, uh, and those 26 urban districts that participate along, as, along with 50 states, uh, we outperform two the overwhelming majority outperform the school district of Philadelphia. We need to change that direct that trajectory and we need to do it quickly as quick as we can. In terms of the state assessments, uh, third grade reading has been flat in the district for a decade. However, third through eighth grade reading has increased four percentage points. Third through eighth grade math has increased five percentage points. The goals and guardrails that our board has adopted requires us not to get incremental gains of three percentage points or four percentage points, but 30 percentage points over the next five years as compared to three, three, three to five percentage points increase over the past decade. So these are aggressive goals. I think the board was bold and courageous to move in this direction, and I think they're putting their, uh, their, uh, uh, their resources and time uh, directly in alignment to achieving these goals and guardrails. So I think this is really significant. So everybody needs to pay close attention to that. Since come aboard, coming aboard as superintendent on June 16th of last year, 
Uh, as you know, I was engaged in three phases of work. The first phase was a 100 day listening and learning opportunity where I had an opportunity to have 90 sessions within the first 100 days with lots of people across the city and school district. The second phase involved a transition team of some 100 Philadelphians and local and national experts who help us to devise 91 short and long term recommendations to consider as we move into phase three, which is the development of a five year aggressive strategic plan. We're doing that work now and we intend to take this plan to the board, continue to work on the board's leadership and we'll take this plan to the board uh, at the May meeting. Next slide. Now, why is this important? As we build a strategic plan, I am crystal clear that the children and families of the school district of Philadelphia can't wait five years. They can't wait until May for us to figure out a roadmap and a plan. So while we are building this plan, and I'll say more about why that plan is important and why it won't just be a piece of paper, our short immediate priorities, our top priority right now in the district is safety. And uh, Board President Streeter spoke a little bit about, to some extent and the other board members spoke to some of the safety measures and student staff wellness efforts that we are undertaking in the district. Uh, to ensure safety is our top priority under the leadership of Chief Kevin Bethel. We also, uh, Board President Streeter said a quick word about, uh, and Board Member Sally, I believe, talked about some of our immediate focus areas. Let me be clear, the way you turn around flat third grade reading scores and three to four to five percentage point increases and in three through eight reading and math and to make significantly greater improvement, the first step is to focus immediately on three areas. Number one, we must increase daily student attendance because students who are in attendance 90% of each month have greater opportunity to improve academically. Second, we must focus on increasing teacher attendance. Why? The research is crystal clear after 50 years. The single most important factor in whether students improve their learning is a highly, highly qualified, well-supported teacher who is stable in a school over time, and they must have good attendance. And third, we want to focus on reducing the number of kids who drop out in the school district. As of the last school year, just shy of 70% of the students in the school district of Philadelphia graduate in four years and there's been a steady uptick increase in that number but it was 70 uh, i rated 70 percent in the last year that means 30 percent of our students don't graduate in four years and a good number of those 30 percent graduate in five some graduate in five or six years and a good number of those are dropouts we need to push hard on getting that 70 percent four-year graduation rate up so those are the areas that we are foundationally focused on right now and we're not waiting uh, for a strategic plan. We're not waiting until May. Now, I do wanna say a couple of words about the strategic plan process that we're engaged in. Next slide. And this is really, 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 really important. Why are we creating, why, why is Tony Watlington taking the time and the board, giving me the time and space to bring together lots of different groups of people, teachers, principals, students, parents, school staffs, uh, central office staff, and some other people outside of the district to develop this plan. It will do five things when it's complete. First, our strategic plan will focus all of the work of the superintendent and the 440 staff in service of schools and students. It's a servant kind of uh, leadership model where we exist at the district office to get teachers and principals in particular, in particular what they need so that they can get students and families what they need. And I call out teachers and principals because the research says that teachers are the number one factor irrespective of your race, ethnicity, income, et cetera, and student growth opportunity. Principals are number two in the research. Principals are so important though, because they impact number one, because they're the people who hire, recruit, onboard, and retain teachers. The second thing that a strategic plan will do, it will help us to figure out how do we better engage with our students, parents, 
community staff, and the unions as equal partners, not as people who we just talk to from time to time, but how do we how do we define what an equal partnership is? What does it look like? And what are the specific strategies that we need to reinvest in? It will help us determine what to stop doing in the school district and what to start doing. Uh, we are developing a fancy name called strategic abandonment tools. In other words, what are the things that we absolutely need to stop doing? Because when we look at the return on investment, we cannot say these things are working. And there are some things we can clearly say are not working. Some of our achieve achievement indicators already tell us that. And so we want to spend the time. We have a team working on that and more to come in May. We all also want this plan to identify a limited number of research based strategies that we know work. And we want to align all of our resources to in order to achieve the board's goals and guardrails. Now, instead of what what hurts a lot of school districts across the country is you have lots of people doing lots of stuff. The key is to do less things, go deeper and do them really, really well. How do you determine what are the few things that you should do really well? First, we look at what the research tells us. We know investment in the science of reading uh, training absolutely helps to improve student performance. It's one of the reasons why the state of Mississippi, which historically has been at the bottom of the line in terms of student outcomes, was one of the fastest improving states in fourth grade reading because of science of reading training. Light bulb goes off. We will absolutely, we're looking at how do we really invest in things like the science of reading training. There are other things that will come about as a part of that process. And in the interest of time, I won't spend a lot of time on those research based, evidence based strategies that we have data and research that we know work. And it's not a mystery as former president board, uh, former board president Wilkerson mentioned. Uh, it's just knowing what the research is and then being laser focused and focus on focus. And then finally, the other key is people must be accountable for improving performance. And that starts with the superintendent. Now, as a superintendent, I want you to know I'm not afraid of accountability. I was a principal three times at the elementary and high school level, and every school I worked at got better. Academic performance went up, dropout rates went down, graduation rates went up significantly because we worked in partnership with uh, our parents and, and other communities uh, members, and we focused on the research. So uh, these, this strategic plan, I want to assure all of you will not just be a piece of paper that looks good on paper with nice pretty pictures. It's about what I will be accountable for, what uh, my cabinet will be accountable for, what the district office 440 staff and all of our school district will be accountable for. And so that's why we want to take the time that make sure that lots of groups are engaged in the process because uh, we want lots of our groups to have ownership. And I'll be honest with you, a teacher has a better sense about what his or her or their their students need at that classroom level. So I've slowed down. I've taken my foot off the accelerator to slow down and say, let's engage teachers in the process. So this strategic plan is not something done to them, but with them and other groups. Next slide. With that, I want to give a quick app update on Act 158. Uh, as you know, uh, the legislature passed Act 158 in 2018. It took effect last uh, spring, uh, last May. And students, uh, rather than just having to be proficient on a test score, one test score, I think the state made a very wise decision uh, to allow students to meet uh, one of five pathways uh, to include uh, the five pathways that you see on this screen. And they also have to meet the local graduation requirements, uh, which includes which includes uh, in Philadelphia 23.5 credits. Now, on December 16th, uh, uh, Chair Thomas, you'll recall that uh, we reported to the City Council that as of December 16th, uh, our seniors had a 42% uh, of our seniors uh, had met uh, all of the had met their pathway and the local uh, requirements of 23.5 credits. And then in January 5th, we reported uh, 
uh, to the community and the media that that number had increased to 47 percent. The number will continue to rise as students complete some of their internships and apprenticeship opportunities and I look forward to giving you an additional update on where we are with Act 158 at the February 21st City Council Education Committee meeting and at the school board meeting, the Board of Education meeting on February 23rd. Uh, next slide. Uh, with that, I'll say thank you for this opportunity to give a quick update on uh, the staff's perspective about where we are and where we're going in the school district. And Mr. Chair, we're happy to answer questions. And I'm sure there'll be plenty. Uh, thank you, Mr. Superintendent. We appreciate um, your communication and we appreciate the presentation. Uh, I'm going to take a moment as um, chair to start uh, with the first uh, several questions. Let's start with Act 158 uh, just because that's where you left off. Um, it's good to hear that we're up to 47 percent. Do we anticipate um, there being any issues as it relates to making sure that young people have access to internship opportunities and other resources that's needed to get that 53 percent across the finish line? I think that uh, it's, it's a work in progress and it, we just will continue to double down in terms of if there are any barriers. I would just remind council that um, given the fact that uh, someone has to coordinate and do the work at the school building level to coordinate uh, internship opportunities, apprenticeship opportunities, meet with people, make sure students and families get connected, cut, uh, uh, connect the dots, etc. We have lean staffs in schools and certainly teachers are knee deep trying to teach to make sure we can get academic performance up. Uh, our counselor ratio historically has been one to 650 as opposed to one to 600, one to 250, as rec which is the national standard recommendation. And so counselors have a full load of work. Uh, the one key barrier that I see having come here superintendent is, dev is devoting the t people time to work exclusively on this issue. And uh, fr from time to time, I'll just be very transparent, I'll hear if people in the community tell me that uh, they reached out to a school and somebody didn't reach back out or that uh, a partnership was started but they didn't feel appropriate was tension was given after something launched that's something we're continuing to work on and allocate resources as best we can thank you um i think that the two million dollars that we gave to the commerce department should have tried to address that issue as far as having a point person that people can go to and i also look at the uh the mayor's office and the education team over there as possibly being a resource as well too because we have to expedite this process. I do want to say thank you to Dr. Uh, Brooks and her entire team uh, because I know she's been running point on this and doing the best that she can given the circumstances that we have. Um, you, you, you mentioned counselors in the midst of your answer. Uh, last week I had my second education debrief conversation um, and we were able to listen to educators from all across the city of Philadelphia and they communicated a number of concerns to us. So one of the concerns that I'm hearing is that counselors are being pulled too many different ways. Um, we talked to, uh, earlier about mental health support and providing mental health support for young people. So I'm wondering, uh, what are we doing about the vacancies as it relates to staffing issues? And I'm not just talking about teacher vacancies because we talk about that all the time. I'm really talking about climate staff. I'm really talking about counselors. And how can we put ourselves in a position where a counselor is only focusing on dealing with those therapeutic, ther the, the the mental issues that young people are facing instead of being responsible for having to cover classrooms and to do other obligations that um, that are essentially dealing with the operations of the school. We want them to be therapists to focus on the therapeutic issues and essentially that's not happening right now. So what's the plan to get us on that point? Uh, I, I'll tell you this is where an external set of fresh eyes is always good for a school district. Uh, one of the things I noticed upon becoming superintendent here is that I could see the clear effects of having to lay off so many individuals in the past decade in order to clean up the district's finances. When all those positions went away, it raised the uh, caseload for counselors. So even though I believe we're currently, our current counselor vacancies are currently staffed at about 98.3% or so now, uh, we need a lot more because the needs that our kids have based on violence and other traumas and uh, their experience during the pandemic, et cetera, we, we just need more help in that regard. So I am not one of those people, uh, Councilmember Thomas, that's always got my hand out and say, just give me more, give me more, give me more. 
uh, I'm, I'm one of those people who says, give me more so I can be accountable for improving outcomes. And that's one area I just will want to be very frank that we need more resources. We need more counselors in schools, particularly schools that are beset by an in uptick in, in gun violence. And I think one of the things that we've been push pushing is a public-private partnership, beginning to rely more on our social service agencies and other um, nonprofit organizations to hopefully supplement for some of the lack of staff that we're seeing. Of course, that's going to be an ongoing conversation. Um, I have several other questions I'm going to hold off for my second round. And what I'm going to do is take a moment to pass it to uh, Council, Council Member Catherine Gilmore Richardson. So Chair recognizes Council Member Catherine Gilmore Richardson. And then after uh, Council Member Catherine Gilmore Richardson, we'll move on to uh, our Majority Leader, Council Member Jones. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Chair. And again, thank you, Dr. Watlington, uh, not only for your testimony, but for your work. Um, I've really enjoyed working with you since you've been at the district, um, particularly around the 21st century schools uh, and the partnership that was announced last week at Strawberry Mansion High School. I'm really excited for your leadership and for your fresh perspective um, at the school district and at 440 in particular. I just wanted to take this time to thank a couple of people who have really been helpful to our office. Um, and starting with Laurel Gerbeck, she has just been phenomenal and very responsive um, and always working with us. Edwin Santana, uh, who is always reaching out to us, checking in with us, getting back to us five, six o'clock in the morning if necessary. So I wanted to say thank you to you also. To Michelle Alexander uh, and the entire team in the CTE office, and in particular, uh, Melanie, who has just been a, a superstar, and Dr. Malika, and so many other professionals, uh, professionals that we've worked with. I wanted to go back to the enrollment piece. Um, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but I wanted to go back to enrollment for this year. What were the projections for this year and what uh, now that leveling has ended, what have you seen as far as the actual enrollment in the district? Uh, thank you, Councilmember Gilmore Richardson. I don't have those numbers in front of me, so I don't want to give you the quote, quote the wrong number. I do have our chief operations officer, uh, Reggie McNeil on the call with us. And I think there may be two things that he could speak to in the interest of time fairly quickly. One, uh, your question about enrollment, if he has those numbers at, at, at the ready. And two, I think there was an earlier question about what are the construction projects that are in play or planned for the near term? And he can, perhaps he can speak to both of those. Uh, Mr. McNeil, are you with us? Thank you, uh, Dr. Wallington, and thank you, Mr. McNeil, and, and I want to thank you, too, um, for always uh, circling back and being very responsive. Yes, yeah, so I'll, um, thank you, Council Member um, Gilmore Richardson. I, I want to first just start off just talking about the construction projects. Um, I heard um, Council Member Harity also ask about uh, the construction projects that we have that are uh, for new schools. So we are building a new school at Cassidy, um, also at Amy at James Martin at home. At TM Pierce, uh, we've already completed the construction project. As you all know, the three schools that we've opened last year or in 2022 was Northeast Propel Academy, Solace Cohen, and also uh, Powell at the Science Leadership Academy Middle School. And we have over 200 active projects between now and the end of 2024. A lot of the projects that we that I've named already that are gonna open in 2024, those three schools in Amy and James Martin, Cassidy and Home, those projects are being funded with our ESSER funds. Uh, so speaking to some of the other council members, uh, make mentioning of the 325 million, that was a, a gift to us that was outside of our normal funding for capital projects to open or build these new schools. We've also committed another $125 million to our guaranteed energy savings X um, projects so that we can make sure that we stay the course in continuing to improve the ventilation across the school district. So we've selected around eight schools um, with that $125 million that we're, we're going to um, actually have centralized cooling plants in those. We've also had funds committed to our maintenance department for our general services contracts to also um, work on the electrical upgrades in a lot of our facilities across the school district. As you noted from last year when we talked, we've had um, 600 plus um, air conditioning units installed in a lot of our schools, and we plan to do much more in the upcoming years in regards to ventilation. Um, okay. in, in regards to, I'm sorry. 
Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm just going to I'm going to pivot over to um, the enrollment piece. I don't have any numbers on enrollment that I can speak to directly um, about the schools, but maybe uh, Ms. Harris is online and she may chief Harris and she may want to speak about our enrollment numbers across the school district. Before we go to enrollment numbers, just a little point of clarity on council member Gilmore Richardson's information uh, question. I'm not going to hold the time against you, colleague. Um, you mentioned eight schools. Uh, what, what are those eight schools? I can what get you those. Schools. I, I don't have them at the top on the top of my mind, but I can give you those at a later time. I mean, I see Council Member Harity leaning up, and I'm I'm hoping I'm reading his mind. You know, Council Member Harity said earlier that we want to really make sure that the infrastructure issues are being addressed in the areas that need them the most. And I think uh, what we're not seeing is um, we're not seeing enough information. Like Council Member Gilmore Richardson also asked. Um, how many students are in the? We this is we we all knew this was happening today. This is basic information that we have to essentially have answers to. Um, I've been pushing this capital issue for some time now. So when I hear anything about any infrastructure happening in schools, I mean you got to automatically know that we're going to ask you. You know what what schools, what areas, what zip codes, especially when you think about the fact that you have so many district council members here who are going to want to know what's happening with the schools in their district. Um, so before we leave today, it would be great if we could get at least those eight schools that you're referencing and an answer to council member Gilmore Richardson's question as it relates to how many children we serve. Let me, let me just say that the board of education is responsible for just uh, approximately 200,000 students in the district. About 120,000 of those students are in the traditional uh, public schools here that I have oversight for. There's approximately 80,000 children or so uh, who uh, the board has some res has responsibility for, and we have a district chief of charters. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not aware of what the projections were last year relative to the enrollment this year because I was not here. But since you've asked that question, rest assured you will get a very prompt response. Hopefully before, and, and I will do everything to make sure that happens before we end this this call. We do have the data. Yeah. Well, I want to be clear, we have the data. Thank and you. If, and, and if I may, can I also answer that question in regards to the eight schools that I may mention of for the Guaranteed Energy Savings Act? So those schools are Benjamin Franklin Elementary School, Clemente High School, Elwood Elementary School, Grover Washington Middle School, Hackett Elementary School, Heston Elementary School, Kirkbride Elementary, and also Locke. Can you, can you repeat that one more time? We don't write that fast, and we're all taking notes. One more time for us, please. Benjamin Franklin. Clemente High School, Elwood Elementary, Grover Washington Middle School, Hackett Elementary School, Heston, Kirkbride, and Locke. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And Mr. Chair, I, I thank you for acknowledging that because my, my question was, please do not hold the capital response and or question against my time because that was not my specific question. I still uh, need my additional allotment for my second round um, in this first round after Dr. Watlington's uh, testimony. So thank you for that acknowledgement. I wanted to, uh, again, um, for the record, I know, Dr. Watlington, you stated that you all will get the enrollment numbers overall for this year. But for a later time, if you could submit to the committee, um, if you could break that down by school, the projected enrollment for that school, the um, actual enrollment now that leveling should have occurred at this point um, for each school so that we understand better school by school what some of the challenges and or issues may be. And we can kind of look at that. Also, my district colleagues can look at that from their district perspective. My other concern is that, and I've been hearing and talking to uh, parents and teachers, and you know, I have children in the district, is around uh, our paraprofessionals. Um, and that um, there's a, a lack of staffing in our paraprofessionals, and I'll name one school in particular, uh, Dobson Elementary. Um, so if you could talk about um, the paraprofessional staffing uh, challenges and how you all are seeking to rectify that. Again, a ton of the questions that I'm asking will go back to um, the need for additional revenue. My concern is that every time there's a conversation around additional revenue for the school district, um, it sort of lands in the lap of city council. When I 
fully and firmly believe that you all aren't doing as much as you can around this enrollment issue um, and around ensuring um, you know, your revenue and ensuring that therefore um, you're able to spend in a certain way. And so can you talk about the challenge with uh, staffing around the paraprofessionals? I'm particularly interested in Dobson, of course, um, but all the schools that are lacking paraprofessionals. Uh, I'll say uh, first that relative to our paraprofessionals, we're staffed about 87.5%. Uh, when I last looked at the numbers, this was as of last week, about 87.5%. What I see as the first year superintendent here are two issues, barriers to use your word, that we've got to get better at. One, uh, I think that uh, some of the jobs, the salary is an issue uh, for the work that paraprofessionals do. Secondly, uh, I've noted by looking at our data that we've got to speed up our onboarding time from the time uh, a hiring administrator says we want to hire council member Gilmore Richardson to the date that 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 you actually show up in that school and you've been cleared through all the state and school district clearances. Those are the two biggest barriers that I see that I've identified. Thank you. Thank you. So if we could just follow up and also uh, understand the staffing challenges and which schools, if we're at 87.5 percent, um, where's that 12.5 percent? Where are those vacancies? Um, you know, what schools? And and schools then have what's much the, pardon me, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I'm sorry, my apologies. Go ahead. No, 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 it's okay. Um, I was just saying for the 12.5 percent, we just want to understand where those vacancies are located and what the remedy is for those schools. And then lastly, I have to get this on the record because I've worked with my team to really try to ensure that the district fully understands what it is that we are requesting. So I'm going to read this out and this will be my last uh, comments and questions for this round and I will circle back to the next round. Um, for the School Finder app, and I'm just going to go down one by one. We're talking about one, a tech issue. The School Finder tool has a GIS issue. I'll give you the example again. Blankenburg versus Mastery Charter School. When the address is put in, it says Mastery for K through sixth grade. Then it says the student would be routed to Blankenburg for seventh and eighth grade, uh, even though Gompers is the closest local public school, which is 0.7 miles away versus Blankenburg, which is 2.1 miles away. Um, but in my understanding, though, if the catchment area is the Renaissance Charter School, which is Mastery Man, then the feeder school for Mastery Man would be Shoemaker, which is also closer than Blankenburg. OK, I'm just using that as an example so you understand how um, this system is not working. Um, I was recently told that this issue was fixed. You know, I checked right away. The issue is not fixed. So, again, the reason why I'm harping on this is not is not personal. OK, it's not personal at all. My kids are in the correct school because we push for it. But I'm talking about all the other children across the district and all the other parents who would have no idea that they are being routed to the wrong place. Number two, it's an information issue. Um, the school finder tool should be um, easier to access um, so that the schools listed parents know the number of options that they have. Most um, families only receive one option. So I'll give you the example again. I'm, live, I'm a mother in Winfield. Catchment school is the Renaissance Charter School Mastery Man, but I never see that I have an option to send my children to Gompers either. Okay, so that option is never made available. So unless you live in that specific side of Winfield where Gompers is the only school available, if you're on the other side of Winfield, you have no clue about Gompers and your children being able to attend Gompers. I'll continue. Um, in addition to that, uh, many families don't know that there is an option to then reach out to the district to apply to the closer local public school. Because when you then call the school to no fault of their own, they then route you to the district, which then routes you back to the information which is on the incorrect school finder app that has the GIS and the technology issue. And then from a longer term perspective, um, I understand and you know fully understand that there are agreements with the Renaissance charter schools that cannot be changed immediately. 
But I do have significant concerns that our neighborhood schools are losing resources due to the declined enrollment because of this technology issue. And so what I would like the district to, to do um, is ensure that we're also giving families every single option. So I just wanted to put that on the record publicly to, to further explain uh, in a different way than I've explained over the past four years uh, to the school district. Um, and obviously Dr. Watlington before your time um, to try to rectify this, this issue. And then I will come back on the, the next round uh, with additional questions. But I wanted, I had to put that on the record so that I can say I put it on the record in addition to the work that we've continued to do with the district behind the scenes for years. Thank you, um, Dr. Watlington, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, colleague. Um, Chair recognizes Council Member Bast. Council Member Jones, thank you for your patience. I appreciate you um, on this. Council Member Bass. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that. I'm having some technical difficulties. So, um, Councilman Jones, I appreciate your uh, indulgence um, as I've been trying to um, get recognized for a minute now. Um, so, um, Dr. Wadlington, I just had a couple of questions for you, and I wanted to start with one um, that, uh, you know, uh, we've, we've had a couple of conversations, I think, about this. And um, I wanted to just go a little bit deeper following up on Kat, uh, Councilwoman Kathy Gilmore Richardson's questions around PSSAs and the reliance of PSSAs and the preparedness that PSSAs uh, provide to our students, because I don't know um, that they have been as helpful as we would like for them to be and being a determinant as to if our young people, when they graduate, are prepared, are qualified, are ready to hit college, the workforce or whatever. And so, um, you know, and, and, and you and I had some conversation. I've had some conversation with your team about just recent events in my own experience with the PSSAs. And so I'm wondering if you could talk about the district's reliance on PSSAs to make critical decisions about um, schools, admittance policies, um, you know, how all of those things work and flow together. Because one of the concerns that I have is that I just had a meeting just yesterday with the president of Temple University. He did a, a great briefing for us around, um, you know, what's happening on campus. One of the things that he mentioned is he talked about how young people coming uh, to Temple University a lot of times are really just still not prepared. They're still not prepared. And so I know that the PSSAs, you know, we rely on them heavily, but what do they prepare our young people for post-graduation if when many of them, uh, when they hit the, the, the doorstep of whatever college or university they want to attend, are still not prepared for uh, the curriculum that, that is being offered? Sure. Uh, I'll start by saying uh, I'll, I'll take the, the former piece first um, in terms of how the district is going about uh, uh, making decisions about admissions to schools and where kids go. Um, president Streeter and I had a meeting last week with uh, President Wingard, as a matter of fact, and, and we talked about some similar things that you're talking about as well. Uh, I will say that uh, cards on the table face up. We know this is not Tony Watlington's opinion. This is a research fact. There is inherent bias, yeah. race bias, and other bias built into standardized testing. Two, there is a bias toward Eurocentric Western thinking in American standardized tests. The PSASA is no different. Now, if you ask me, um, Tony Watlington, what should we do about that? My professional and personal belief, both as a parent of three students, former students myself, and as a dad and as a superintendent, is that we should never make important decisions based on one test standardized test score. Ever. Okay. Not in K-12 education way. We agree. should use we should use multiple measures. Uh, we should use multiple measures for who gets promoted from one grade to the next. Mm 
Mm-hmm. We should use multiple measures for what are the graduation uh, standards and requirements. We should okay. use multiple measures for who should get into, uh, say, at colleges and universities, whether it's a two or four year institution. Now, even in the school district, I think we should use multiple measures for how we make really hard decisions about sure. admissions to uh, special schools. Uh, given that uh, PSSA should not be the driver, I think you should uh, make that one of several factors, along with grades, attendance, uh, and some other measures. So that that would be my short answer to the question. Okay. So. Can I add oh yeah, of course. And I, I think my, also one, uh, one of my constituents from the AK yeah, right in Germantown. Um, <laughs> But I think also, um, you know, as it relates to Harrisburg and, you know, I think we all have bought into uh, PSSAs Mm -hmm. and Keystones not being the end all be all. But as it relates to persuading some individuals from certain political persuasions about funding us, often they want to say, show me the beef. How do we know that, you, you know, what you're doing is worth our investing of more state dollars? And I think the PSSAs, the Keystones are often the tool that they throw in our face and say, hey, if you want more funding, do that. So again, so it's, it's a very complicated issue with a lot of onions. I know that is probably higher level than the questions you were asking about, you know, special admits and stuff like that. But I'm just sure. letting you know why it's still a thing in the district. And as the board, we kind of feel compelled to balance both interests the best we can. I, I hear you. I think that the fact that that um, everybody here recognizes that the PSSAs and the standardized testing in general, that there are, you know, uh, biases in the uh, in the system. Like we know this. It's not um, something that is uh, questionable that that in and of itself should really give us significant pause. And so, um, you know, I just you know, I, I just really want to put that out there because We recognize that there's a problem here and uh, whatever action we take long term is going to be good for our students. And I'm uh, trusting, I guess, that Dr. Wadlington, that it is on your radar to be addressed. I know you haven't been here quite for a year yet, but I'm certainly hoping that you and our new school board president and the entire board and and your leadership team plan on having some robust conversations around this issue. Councilman Bass, I'll just say one other thing, if the chair will permit me to say it very, very quickly. Uh, A question that we have to call, though, is with all the inherent bias in the nation's report card, the NAEP test, out of 26 urban districts, why do most of them outperform the children in Philadelphia? Mm -hmm. They've got the same bias that we have built in the tests. So uh, on the one hand, I don't think it's or I think it's both. And so I am not I am on the record with the board. I do not believe that we ought to completely throw tests out of K-12 until higher ed says they're no longer going to have an LSAT. We'll no longer have an LSAT for folks like uh, President Streeter and others who who were who, who, who figured out how to master that to go to law school mm-hmm. or the GRE or the MCAT that people have to to go to medical schools because I expect people from Philadelphia to graduate from us and go on to be lawyers and doctors and engineers to go to the trades and do a lot of other things. So I think a couple of things that we can do to help mitigate some of that is Mm -hmm. Board Member Sally or somebody mentioned this earlier. We're taking a look at what we're learning from the research on high dosage tutoring. There's a growing body of research. I know a high dosage tutoring in math in particular that's mm-hmm. showing nominal improvement in some urban districts. So we're trying to figure that space out at the same time. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Well, listen, I, I have an appreciation for um, the work that lays ahead of you in trying to um, address this issue. And um, and, and I, too, uh, feel that uh, uh, our students should, should go on to be doctors and lawyers and all the great things that they want to be. And that standardized testing, of course, is a part of the conversation uh, along the way. Um, but I guess from what I've seen, that heavy, it, it feels to me, uh, and this is just my own opinion, that the PSSAs are very heavily relied upon. Um, in terms of making decision and that there's no variation whatsoever within the district and that causes concern. And so mm-hmm. I'm asking that um, that concern is looked into and reexamined, um, you know, because uh, uh, it, it, th- th- there should be some additional opportunity to provide input in my in my opinion. Um, 
The other question, and I know I'm short on time, the other question that I had was, um, uh, as I mentioned, uh, I had a meeting yesterday. With, oh, yes. Am I out of time? No, what, well, just for the record, what I'll say in Councilmember Jones is queued up next. Um, just for clarity, Councilmember Bass did not get to ask any questions yet. So I do think it's fair that we give you a little more time just so you can get your stuff in because you didn't get an opportunity and you were having technical difficulties. So please. Thank you. Thank you. So I get an extra hour, right? So uh, <laughs> got to negotiate with your majority leader for that. <laughs> he, he, he seems like, OK, he said yes. He said yes. <laughs> OK, so no, I don't. I have um, just a couple of more questions really quickly. So I was saying that Temple University yesterday I had a meeting uh, with the president. It was a great meeting. But, but I wanted to double back on what he spoke about in terms of preparedness from uh, Philadelphia School District students and um, the lack of preparedness, essentially, and the fact that, um, you know, there's an additional cost that comes with that lack of preparedness. You have to take essentially remedial courses to be able to get up to speed. And those co courses cost the same amount, uh, you know, as regular tuition, you know, classes that uh, you can add towards your, your matriculation. So um, I'm wondering, um, you know, what are we doing to make sure that, that that our young people, when they hit those doorsteps, that they're ready? I still don't feel like I've gotten um, clarity on that. Sure. Um, I, I and think progress, yeah. Absolutely. There, 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 there are multiple things that we are doing. Uh, one is the number one thing that we have to continue to do is be sure that we staff schools with highly qualified, well-supported teachers, highly qualified, well-supported principals. Not just anybody who wants to teach, to be really clear, mm -hmm. highly qualified, however we measure that. Two, we, have, we are focusing in on making sure that students have 90% attendance each month and that teachers have 90% each month. We're not there yet. Uh, we report out on that data every month to the Board of Education, and we're very clear to say to the board, we're getting better, we're about the same, or we're getting worse, so that we keep that flashlight shined on teacher and student attendance. Third, we're doubling down in the strategic planning process to make sure that kids have access to high quality curriculum. Here's how you know if kids have high access to high quality curriculum. First, there are groups nationally that evaluate it, you know, whether it's the Clearinghouse, What Works Clearinghouse, or uh, Ed Reports. We want to make sure that every student has access to grade level curriculum, grade level materials, a certain percentage of the day. Because what happens with poor black and brown children, we give them low level work because we say they're not prepared to do grade level work. And there's a way that we can bridge that gap because the bottom line is that we will never remediate our way to excellence. Then we have to we're working on professional development for teachers in particular and other school staff. What are we giving people professional development on? Uh, we're going to go much harder on the science of reading. So we teach literacy better as a part of the strategic plan. We're focusing on make sure, making sure that teachers really understand the content that they're teaching. This is really important because a lot of teachers don't nowadays don't have the benefit of having gone through a teacher education program and really learning to become really good teachers. So we have to supply a lot of that for our uh, non-traditional teachers and at the school level. And we have to teach we're doing professional development on how do you engage students in the learning. And then we're focusing really heavily on how do we provide other supports and we're not there yet in terms of high dosage tutoring. Those are of those the one that we're the ones that we're focused on the most right now is teacher attendance and student attendance and getting our arms around the dropout problem and the number of kids who are not in school. And okay. Councilmember Bass, so I can step in here real quick if possible sure. just to add some context from the board's perspective. It's almost as if you're at our action meetings, right? We, we are mm -hmm. talking about student outcomes, preparing children for college and things mm -hmm. like that. And whether it's on the uh, district side or our, our public uh, charter school side, this board has a laser focus on ensuring with, with whatever we in whatever ways we can that children have the access to the educational experience, holistic experience that prepares them for whatever they want to do in life, whether they want to be a, a, a Instagram influencer, right? Or whether they want to go to a college um, and go, you know, become a lawyer. Um, and it does break my heart when I know a student has graduated, I talk to professors at Temple 
students who come from our, pro, our public charter uh, sector, but also our, our public school sector, when they can't write an essay, right? Mm -hmm. When they have to take uh, 10th grade math in college, yeah. which sometimes yeah. can cause a child to say, I, I'm done with this, right? Yeah. When in fact, it's I, not the child, it's the adults who right. fail. So right, right. many people are wondering why we're making the decisions we're making. And maybe we need to be more communicative about it. Mm -hmm. It's for that reason. We, we just, we won't, we won't anymore sit, sit on the sideline and say, we did, we did the best we could and that and it's okay for children to graduate and not be able to have the skills they need. So I'm with you 100%. And, um, and I'm also aligned with you as it relates to uh, standardized testing. I understand your concerns as well. But, yeah. So we're going to continue to remain yeah. pragmatic, but also laser focused on uh, student achievement. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I, I see that the chair has returned. So I guess I have to uh, give up the mic. But I do want to add, add one more thing really quickly, which is, um, you know, I, I did hear Dr. Wadlington mention um, a number of other things that are happening in other districts and they're seeing significant results. And yet Philadelphia is not. And I don't know that I've really gotten a, a clear uh, answer as to why that is happening. I guess I could take a lot of the different answers and sort of cobble them together and figure, okay, well, there's a number of different reasons why we're not seeing those results here in Philadelphia. But if there's anything that you wanted to add over what you said, that's, you know, just really, um, that makes it, that sort of crystallizes uh, what you've already said, because, you know, I think that there's a lot of different things that go into uh, why we're not seeing the real results, whether it's staffing, whether it's, you know, uh, other things that are happening uh, personally with the student, um, you know, with, whether it's environment, all, all of these things add up together. Um, to say that, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 what we're offering isn't working. So I don't know if there was anything else that you wanted to add, you or Mr. Streeter wanted to add on that. Uh, I'll just say, I don't know about President Streeter. I'll, I'll just say that uh, part of the reason why we have 100, why we have a, a, a steering committee and advisory groups engaged in look in developing the strategic plan is we're taking the time to look at other districts to study them in depth. It's kind of like if you ask someone, why does state A have more cancer uh, 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 cancer incidents of cancer than a state another state? You've got to take the time to dig into the data. And uh, then when you think you know the right answer, you have to test it to say, is that really what's causing the outcome? Right. And we're taking the time as a part of the strategic plan development work to really study those districts and the research and the data. What we know is for a fact, though, is out of 26 urban districts that take the NAEP assessment, uh, we outperform two, uh, the others outperform us. And that's been a trend over time. We also know that third grade reading has been flat we know states like Mississippi have significantly improved uh, early grades reading by science of reading. So some of the answers I can tell you in, th that we just know some of the things we need to focus on, but we want to take the time to go really deep in that. But while we're doing that, we're not just twiddling our thumbs. We're going to we're focusing very heavily on uh, get it, making sure that teachers and, and, and uh, students have good attendance, which is proven to be a pretty tall order by itself. But we, we're going to say we're going to double down and get that done. And we're committed to getting better in that regard. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wadlington, and thank you, President Street. I appreciate it. And thank you to Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, colleague. Appreciate you. Uh, Chair so recognizes. You too. Anytime. Chair recognizes Council Member Jones, and those were great council, uh, questions, too, colleague. Uh, Council thank Member uh, uh, Majority Leader Jones. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and those were great comments by Member Bass and ones that we will take into consideration. I just want to say, Dr. Wellington, I am going to use and attribute it to you. Cards on the table face up. I'm going to use that. That is, that is a pretty good metaphor for being forthcoming, and I liked it. So I'm going to take that one for my lexicon of one-liners. That's in my it's in my playbook now. Um, I want to thank you and your team uh, for um, Cassidy. I'm excited about the new construction. I believe it's one of two schools being uh, newly constructed. Um, and I believe at the end of the day, <clears throat> it will be where the Jetsons, would have wanted to send their kids. And they're using maker space. They're using, there's a weather station going to be in there. There are outdoor classrooms in cases of high 
instances of uh, pandemic related flus. So it's being designed with the future of our children and career paths in mind. So for that, I am truly grateful. There's a um, TV and radio station want to be a part of it. So it's exciting to me. But I will push back gently to my colleagues to say that the reason you, the school district picked that location to do new construction was because of the condition of the building. It was a toxic environment, asbestos, lead in the water, and just totally price-wise said <clears throat> it is cheaper to tear it down and build new construction. Not because the neighborhood was underperforming in a drastic way. It, it could do better, but it wasn't the worst. But by way of fairness, we also have to consider the the buildings that our children are forced to and the teachers are forced to uh, operate within. So I'd like that to be balanced out to the greater uh, consideration as well. With that in mind, with the prospect of Cassidy, that it, that is a good school that I want to feed into a historic school, which is Overbrook. We have... Um, <clears throat> endured a lack of investment, capital investment in that school for a while. The last time we did something meaningful was our multimedia studio of $2.5 million was invested um, to bring a state-of-the-art TV, radio, and communications program in there. But what we were also assured would be the other shoe was that there was going to be an auditorium that they could do performances, that they could do productions right out of. Right now, they have a box where they bring up for the microphone, and it's, it's inadequate to do anything. No lighting systems. The stage is, was there when I gave my first speech um, in public office for, for, you know, running for a class uh, office. So it's been a long time. And what I see happening is that we'll kick the can down the road and then a new superintendent will come. A new set of staff will come. And all of the promises and commitments that were made, people scratch their head, well, that wasn't me. Let me look into it, which begins a, another clock, which is unacceptable for the kids that go through that school that aren't, aren't getting what they should have. Um, <clears throat> so what we're getting at Cassidy, we should be mindful that the fourth and fifth floors of Overbrook have been abandoned since they had a great music program. So ideas like a CTE component to Overbrook are what we would love to hear about. We have the Man Music Center, and Live Nation that have partnered to bring some of our young people from Overbrook down to gain valuable experience in the performing arts, in the behind the scenes. And if we could somehow incorporate that meaningful mentorship to some actual studios and actual uh, technical classes in Overbrook, we could increase our enrollment which at one time at its height was like 1,500 students, which is down now to 400, which is un... Uh, you, my, even my dog doesn't agree. Um, it's, un <laughs> it's unsustainable to have that much infrastructure. So we've been asking about a plan to save Overbrook. We've been asking about a capital plan to invest in Overbrook. And each year we don't do that. There's another group of young people that wind up with less than desirable outcomes. And we need, um, so that's, I always talk about, you know, we don't have a lot of time. We can't defer 
generations of law students. So we need some expedition on our planning and more importantly, our execution of good ideas and a consistent improvement plan. So the question, the wind up question is, what's going to happen to my alma mater, Overbrook High School? I heard you say, uh, 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 Council Member Jones, uh, something about you get a new superintendent and this, this uh, I've got to look into it, look into this, et cetera. So I, I hear your voice in my head. So I, I just want to uh, say to you that um, I also heard you say that the student enrollment uh, 1500 at Overbrook declined over time to 400. Uh, 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 very fine stately uh, building built in a different time with a different uh, at least number of population. I think that speaks to a lot of challenges across the district in terms of uh, as the numbers decline in some buildings, how do you make the most uh, wise and student-centered decisions about building utilization so that you don't have some schools very underutilized uh, and perhaps in some districts, some overutilized. The long, the short answer to your question is that while Cassidy, the construction for Cassidy and the other projects are continuing as planned, uh, the operations team is continuing to put air conditioners in places where, where, where they have the resources and the bandwidth to get that done. The decisions about what will happen in the facilities planning process relative to schools like uh, Overbrook, et cetera, we put that on, uh, recommended to the board that we put that on pause until we get the academic strategies built out in the strategic plan. So uh, my thinking is uh, we will pick that back up very shortly after we get the strategic plan finalized because we want to know how many advanced placement labs do we have need to have science labs do we need to have in every high school? How many um, CTE labs and what kind of CTE labs need to be built in the schools? It would be premature for us to walk down the road and say, well, let's just start doing this with this school until we get that figured out. And so uh, uh, I'd like, I personally think it's really important that we build out the academic strategies and the strategic plan. And then from there, we pick the facilities planning process back up right after we uh, get that academic strategic plan approved by the board in May. And then we'll have more uh, direction and answers to where we go specifically to Overbrook and other schools in the district. That that's. Uh, uh, that that's my long and short answer to your question. Well, I and Leader Jones, uh, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say I think you're asking a very important question, right? How do you balance the future and the now, right? And I I think for those in the public who don't know what we're what we're attempt what, what we're doing is uh, we we looked at state places like Washington D.C. that took the time to be very strategic to rebuild their infrastructure, where to build where to where to rebuild buildings, where to knock ones down and build new ones, where to retrofit buildings for 21st century learning. That's what we're doing, but you're right. That doesn't mean necessarily that we have to stop doing all investments. So schools like Cassidy, right, is, is an example of, even though we're thinking about the future now, we can try our best to walk and chew gum at the same time. So I just wanted to put that context out there. This is not meant to say what you said had no value. I think it has a lot of value. It's just for, just for, uh, for fact, just for people to understand the facts. So what, 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 is, what is the board thinking about and why some things may take a little longer than others, but I digress. So I like the, I'm going to use that adage, cards on the table face up. I have been a supporter of the school district, a reliable vote on taxes in tough times and good times. I go back to when me and uh, um, then council member Jim Kenny sat in a room and he was a he was a firm supporter of the school district then took tough tax votes. And that's why I respected him. I'm not going to sit back and let time just keep going by over, bro. I am not, and I'm, and I speak for not just my some of my colleagues that uh, know Overbrook's plight have visited Overbrook with you. I speak for my colleagues at the state, Senator 
Hughes, and Representative Cephas, who represent Overbrook High School. We're not going to sit around and let our young people suffer the fate of school to prison pipeline. They have a disproportionate amount of people with IUPs. We get a disproportionate amount of people who sometimes young people who run afoul of the law. I have to give them, and I'm talking about home investors like Mr. Santana who spent a lot of money on his house, but to give them a reason to enroll their kids in local schools and not have to pay that extra tax of sending their kids to non-public schools. So you, I want to give you the runway you need, but let me say this, here, you know, cards on the table. I am running out of patience because I've been promised this. And you've taken that tour. You, you've seen the abandonment. And my, my principal over there is fighting the good fight. She, um, she fights for those young people who have problems when they walk in that school. But if we put some really nice programs in there, we will attract more residents to feel confident to take their children to Overbrook. But if we follow this, kick the can down the road, it'll continue the course that it's going. And so I want to give you the runway, but it's not infinite. It, I, I mean, I want to be a good vote, but I'm, I'm going to make sure that none of my schools are left behind. So that, that's not a question. That's a comment. Thank I, you, I do. I would like to note for the record, if I, if I might, uh, uh, Council Member Jones, that uh, uh, since my arrival, we have uh, uh, moved on some plans to support students in the near term at Overbrook High School, which is a high school we care about very much, just like our others. And uh, the 21st century uh, model that we've implemented some new programming in that school to help students to have some great opportunities when they graduate. Uh, if I could just ask uh, Tomas Hanna, who is the Associate Superintendent for High Schools, he could just take 30 seconds to just say a quick word about that. I think that's really important. Can you all hear me this morning, gentlemen? Yes. It's good to see you, Ca Councilman Jones. I'm no longer living in your district, but it's a, ple it's a pleasure to see you. You don't you remember me because I didn't have this before. You can come back. No worries, my friend. So he, 30 seconds. Uh, so as, as you're aware, the 21st Century Grant opportunity allows us to work specifically with Overbrook High School, West Philadelphia High School, and Bartram. And the kind of work we're looking to do there now as we engage in strategic planning, but the commitment is to engage ninth, you know, ninth graders moving forward uh, in areas of entertainment, issues you called out, digital media, fashion, not just the craft, but the business of it, because not only do we want our young people to sort of engage in, you know, uh, preparing things, we want them to be the owners of the businesses, right? And I think that's what, 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 what you're looking for. We're also, just so you're aware, we want to be sure that special ed students will also walk out with, with vocational, with CTE training, right? Uh, so that they have a, you know, a credential and an opportunity to sort of leave us with, with options in, in, in this work. So I just wanted to, uh, you know, chime in there because I know this is something that's been very uh, near and dear to your heart. And I would call out that, as was mentioned earlier uh, on our CTE work, um, uh, Dr. Malika Brooks has been very, very instrumental in providing that support for us, number one. And, and number two, earlier we, talk, we talked about um, our CTE uh, director, uh, Michelle Armstrong. So they're all lockstep in doing this work. So I just wanted to call that out uh, as, as this is a sort of a rug to your point, this, consider this part of the runway as we sort of look at the bigger at the bigger opportunity, because when the strategic planning work happens, we want to be sure that we're incorporating that which works from this grant opportunity so that that can be scaled up. And again, we're not just talking overbook West Philadelphia, West Philadelphia High School in Bartram. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll just I'll step back. I, I appreciate that um, for the record. I do. But look at it from my lens. Daroff closed. Bluford Life Support, a number of charter establishments in my district closed. Options shrinking. I'm beginning to think you got something against the fourth district. So disproportionately, we are 
losing our education options. And I, I have to I have to stand up for the parents and young people that this impacts. So please give some consideration to that. But in closing, there's not a CTE program on my side of the river, west side of the river, that they can go to. The closest one is west. That's in the third. And I appreciate the crown jewel of CTEs, Randolph, but that's on the other side. And our young people have to travel too far to get to the educational um, options that they need. So thank you for your consideration. And, and, and if, I might, if I might, Dr. Watlington, in, in my previous role at, at PD prior to returning, we have been having a conversation about where dual enrollment needs to be happening across the Commonwealth, including in Philadelphia. We're undertaking here within the district as we come in, where are our CTE programs? Where are the, voc the traditional vocational programs? And, and what, what does access look like across the city? So uh, we, we, we are there and it is part of this conversation. So I appreciate you. We have nothing against the fourth, trust me. We, we, you know, we have nothing against the force. So I appreciate that. Thank you, Dr. Thank Wallington. I appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Leader. Chair recognizes uh, Council Member Gilmore Richardson. And then I think that um, then followed by myself. And I think I will be the last one to close us out uh, for today. Council Member Gilmore Richardson. Thank you. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Chair. And uh, thank you again um, to all the team at the school district for your, your help and support today. And I'm looking forward to receiving the information that we've requested uh, at today's hearing, uh, recognizing that we're at the end. And so I wanted to start where Councilmember Jones left off. Um, everyone knows that I deeply care uh, about career and technical education in the city of Philadelphia. It is something that I've uh, tried to focus on. Uh, it is something that my colleagues have supported me on relative to ensuring that our CTE students um, even have a point preference when they apply for civil service work here in the city of Philadelphia. So I wanna pause there to thank Michelle Alexander and her entire team for all of their uh, hard work. I wanted to pick up uh, though where Councilmember Jones has left off. How are we, and if you could give us this information for the record, how are we looking at all of our career and technical education programs and how are we then aligning them with the jobs that we know are in our labor market forecast for the city of Philadelphia, both short term and long term? And I'll specifically uh, highlight uh, the advanced manufacturing jobs, uh, the jobs that are available in the life sciences industry, um, and a number of other industries that we know are burgeoning here in the city of Philadelphia. So how are we realigning some of those CTE programs to meet the jobs uh, that are here, um, but also the jobs that we know will be here uh, in the future? And if we could take a moment to talk about that, uh, and I really wanted to get on that on the record because I'm introducing a resolution uh, tomorrow uh, in council uh, that will uh, ask the district uh, to come before us again for hearings around the creation of a high school that's specifically focused on career and technical education in several of those industries. Um, that's the first thing. Uh, secondly, I wanted to thank that office um, for working with us as we continue to work on the regs with the administration um, around the implementation of the point preference for our students. And then finally, the learning loss that our young people have experienced. I don't think we've spent enough time there, um, particularly as a parent of young people in the district. I have a son who's in uh, kindergarten. I have a daughter who's in second grade and another daughter who's in 11th grade. And so um, I recognize sort of what's happening uh, with the students across the district at different schools, whether they're neighborhood schools versus special admission schools. And so can we talk about the learning loss and what we're doing specifically to help young people around reading because I'm very concerned that the AARP program has now been removed from uh, the schools. Uh, I'll say two things, uh, Council Member uh, uh, Gilmore Richardson. First, uh, as a part of the strategic planning process, we're doing a review of all of our CTE programs, the content, what are we currently offering relative to traditional, what some people refer to as trades. I've heard some people in the city say the old vocational education, et cetera, but tra more traditional CTE programming. 
we're also trying to take a look at what are the what are some of the more uh, current or new opportunities related to things like advanced manufacturing, coding, and life sciences since you referenced, and that's absolutely true, it's a burgeoning area, particularly here in Philadelphia that I think uh, uh, has an infrastructure with the colleges and university in part with the University of Pennsylvania and other uh, higher ed institutions. Number two, uh, I'm doing a tour of, of CTE programs across the district with Guy, Dr. Guy Generals, president at the Community College of Philadelphia, because we're trying to think through as we work, do the strategic plan work, how do we survey what we currently have across the district, A. B, how do we make sure that we have geographic representation to Council Member Jones's point? For example, I, the first school I went to look at was in the greater Northeast at Swenson High School. It's no surprise my next visit with Dr. Journals will be at Dobbins High School. And we're going to ask ourselves, what does it, what, what does the CTE programming look like across the district? Where are these programs located? How many kids are earning industry certifications in higher paying jobs? And we want to map that out. So we it's not anecdotal, but we know kind of factual information. And then finally, uh, one of the reasons why we brought in a an associate superintendent for secondaries for high schools in particular was to shine more attention on the high schools. So um, I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Hanna, Tomas Hanna, if you'll take another 30 seconds to say something about the workforce development strategy that he's been tasked with helping us to implement. Yes, th th thank you so very much, uh, Dr. Watlington and uh, Councilwoman Gilmore Richardson. Thank you for your interest as well as as, as Councilman Jones. Um, I want to just for the record, because I just want to be clear, the person you've been referring to, you, I think you mean Michelle Armstrong, not Alexander, who is on. I CTE. apologize. No worries. No worries. <laughs> I just want to make sure um, she's doing a great job and, and will be part of the superintendent's team as we go out, visit the uh, CTE programs. Uh, part of the work that we've done at at at, uh, at the that the that I had the pleasure of doing at the state was bringing together folks to a commission that was um, uh, uh, written into the school code, not a commission, a committee of sorts. We actually had a committee meeting here in Philadelphia uh, where we highlighted the paraprofessional to teacher program, right? About a hundred some odd paraprofessionals going into the uh, into the teaching field, and uh, Esser's dollars have helped. Uh, support support that. So as we look at our our teacher our teacher um, uh, issues uh, vacancy issues, we're looking at paraprofessionals to fill those vacancies. Number one, uh, number two, part of that work included the creation of a of a program of study in the field of education, which the Department of Education in Pennsylvania has authorized, has approved, and will be will be available for use by high schools uh, to to uh, engage young people in wanting to teach early. And so we know of five high schools that want to engage in that program. Now we're going to put it out there. Michelle Armstrong under her leadership, we're going to be sort of taking a look at what that what that means. What a program of study means, Councilwoman, is that there is a, a what's called a, a tasks and standards list, which basically has been created by folks to say, what is it that our students need to know and be able to do as they think about engaging in the profession? Some would argue we need to be doing this. I think I heard it earlier. We need to be doing this work earlier in the middle schools because, you know, Sharif el actually has been part of that committee that put this together in his team. He will say that many times men of color, particularly black men, don't learn about the teaching profession until they're in college, right, and don't know that it's an option, right? And so we want to be really sure that, meanwhile, white women are learning in third grade that it's an option. It's not a problem. It is what it is. And guess what? That's who the preponderance of our, of our teachers are. They're phenomenal. We need them in our schools, but we need them to be you know, culturally competent as we do this work. And that's the kind of work that, that we're looking to, you know, to engage in. So lastly, part of the reason for making it a CTE opportunity is that it enables the state to engage PDEs, not PDEs, the state's Department of Labor so that we can register these as apprenticeships. Imagine our paraprofessionals who have jobs, that job could serve as their apprenticeship so that we can then leverage dollars so that the opportunity in, uh, for our teachers, for our prospective teachers is at no cost to them. And so that we eliminate two things. One, we attract prospective teachers, mostly teachers of color, number one, and do so without debt if we're able to do this at, at, you know, through these partnerships as, uh, from the Department of Labor. So we're really committed to doing that work. Um, and that, guess what? We have to ask students what they wanna do and show them where the vacancies are and where the opportunities are. The opportunities are in the school district of Philadelphia. 
teaching and doing all kinds of other things. So I just wanted to put that out there. Those were my 30, uh, Tomas Hanna, 30 seconds. My apologies, Superintendent. Okay. I just want to jump in here really quickly and uh, thank you for that response and thank you for the uh, clarification because uh, that was uh, really a moment. Uh, but thank you to Michelle Armstrong um, at the district who we work with very closely. Um, Mr. Hanna, you talked about middle years exposure. Um, that's what it is, exposing our young people in middle school to these opportunities. Um, you also talked about the CTE programs, and for me, it's the realignment of those programs to match the jobs that are in our labor market forecast, both short term and long term. Um, and I appreciate that you all are thinking about how you work with DOL to ensure these programs are registered apprenticeship programs. And, and I'm sure, depending on the field, you all are working with the building trades on that as well, similar to the program at Strawberry Mansion. Les, I wanted to mention just a couple things that I have to get on the record, uh, particularly because I'm not on the education committee. Um, but the uh, PDE, I know we work with Governor Wolf, who had agreed when Dr. Height was here um, to work with us around our applications to PDE for any new uh, CTE programs. So I would implore you all to reach out to the Shapiro administration um, to ask for that assistance as well. Um, in addition to that, I uh, wanted to mention two other things. Uh, the implementation of Tier 1 conflict resolution in all of our schools. We had worked with uh, Dr. Gray and her team uh, on the implementation of the, the tier one opportunity. And I just want to make sure that that is still happening and that every school has the opportunity to select a tier one conflict resolution program that is paid for by 440 and does not impact um, the revenue of that local school and their ability to hire other professionals as deemed necessary by their administration and the school staff. And then lastly, I wanted to um, end with thanks uh, and thanking you all at the district in the transition from Dr. Height and Dr. Watlington um, for uh, submitting the application to the federal government uh, for the water infiltration system upgrades for the district. Um, I am a member of the United States Environmental Protection Agency's Local Government Advisory Committee. I asked the school district um, to apply for this grant opportunity that was directly from EPA and would be directly to the district. Um, we worked out some challenges in, in the meantime, and you all did apply for the grant opportunity. It's almost $5 million that has been awarded to the district um, around the um, the water infiltration system installation at each of the schools. And so I would just ask that we can get an update on that uh, in writing to see how many more schools will be able to uh, service as a result of that grant money that we receive from the EPA. And then I'm interested in learning how you are interfacing to figure out um, what other grant opportunities are available. Obviously, all the opportunities I get from EPA, I send them directly to the school district and or uh, said uh, city agency and or department. But how are you all looking to ensure that you're not missing any opportunities um, with this sort of once in a career lifetime infrastructure package uh, availability that we have from D.C., thanks to President Biden? Uh, and then uh, finally, I look forward to continuing to work with all of you on a number of issues that we know will be important, um, particularly our, our capital plan uh, around our school buildings. Uh, and again, back to the enrollment issue so that we can finally get that rectified um, before um, you know, we conclude this budget process this year. Thank you and thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, uh, Council Member Gilmore Richardson, uh, yes, it's my understanding that tier one conflict resolution is uh, is continuing as uh, as you as you communicate it. I'll ask Chief uh, Karen Lynch, Chief of Student Services, to just take 30 seconds. We won't go into detail. We'll just ask her to give 30 seconds verification of that uh, of that information, and we'll be we'll, we'll be happy yes. to submit the detailed information in our follow up. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Watlington. Yes, um, Councilwoman uh, Dr. Gray is very much committed. We are still very much at it. Um, we are now in the process of entering into um, the phase where schools get to select. And so um, we're looking forward to giving you additional updates on what we're doing and how well it's going. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And I look forward to those uh, updates to ensure that, you know, each school has that program because that was the agreement we made with the district um, last year. Yes. 
Council Member, are you good to go? Yes, I just wanted to update on the federal infrastructure dollars. Mr. Superintendent. Uh, anything in particular that you want me to speak to, uh, Councilmember Gilmore Richardson? I can tell you that the first first focus area uh, for those dollars related to uh, 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 student learning loss, and there were three hundred and fifty million dollars allocated for that purpose. Uh, area two, there was a focus on improving facilities in the district, uh, and and the legislation, as I recall. In a, in a previous district was re related to in mitigation of or prevention of COVID or airborne problems. And I recall that in this district spent allocated $325 million for that purpose. The third focus area was on uh, related to social and emotional needs of students, which was absolutely appropriate given the significant impact of the pandemic and $150 million was originally allocated for the district. Uh, I'll make sure that we provide more detailed follow-up uh, related to the budget expenditures. Uh, that's a matter of public record in, in our written follow-ups. That'll be great. Yeah, I just really wanna know if there are any additional opportunities that you all are going to apply for um, to try to augment and supplement uh, some of the revenue challenges we know that we anticipate. Um, I, I, know and recognize the wonderful work that you all have been doing, but I just wanted to have sort of a forecast um, and what your plans are for some of the other federal projects that we may or may not even know about right now because they're coming down the pipeline so quickly um, so that we can try to augment our revenue um, process. Sure. Lastly, I got to get this one on the record and I'm done. Girls High, the Philadelphia High School for Girls, my alma mater, they were asking for um, a, a charter bus. I had a summit with the girls at City Hall on safety. They are having a, a safety conference uh, at LaSalle a University, I believe, in April. Um, and the girls just gave a very robust presentation to all the members of council and, and were with us for a council session. They are asking for a charter bus or the charter bus from Central to be extended uh, up to um, and have availability for the girls at the Philadelphia High School for Girls. So I wanted to put that on the record because I did meet with the girls directly at the school um, to ensure that they receive some type of uh, support directly from the district. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, to thank your you point, we'll follow up on Girls High, Mr. Chairman, and also the short answer is yes, we're going to continue to recommend uh, to the board that we of education that we apply for federal dollars for which we are eligible to help augment our budget, our underfunded budget. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Superintendent. Thank you, colleague. Um, I'm going to uh, close this out with a couple questions. Um, I want to start with um, a question from one of my colleagues. So. Um, Looking at some of the issues that we have around uh, safety, um, one of the issues around safety is staffing issues. So I'm wondering um, if the school district would be able to give us the total number of vacancies for teachers as well as non-instructional staff members. Um, if we can get a list of how many vacancies we have for these critical positions. Um, we're talking about counselors, assistant superintendents, assistants, assistant principals. Um, we're talking about other uh, climate staff, um, counselors, things of that capacity. If we can just get a breakdown of the vacancies um, and get a breakdown by position, um, if that could be sent to me, I can assure that members of the education committee as well as other council members get that information. And I know you guys sent us a report around capital planning. Um, if we can get um, a list of the new construction that's taking place. We got the eight schools that was discussed today, um, but if we can get the list of new construction that's taking place and what's going to be happening in the pipeline as it relates to that $2 billion over the next six years with as much uh, uh, as much detail as possible, that would also be very much appreciated. Um, <clears throat> sticking with school safety. Um, Duly so noted, we'll do, Mr. Chairman. Oh, thank you, Mr. Superintendent. Um, sticking with school safety, um, last week, uh, again, um, I held an education debrief conversation, which helps inform myself and other members of the education committee as it relates to issues that schools are facing. And one of the issues that was communicated to us is working cameras. Do we have an idea of how many of our 
comprehensive high schools as well as our middle schools do not have working cameras. Um, it's a huge safety concern that teachers communicated to us. And I'm going to be honest with you, I was outside of a school yesterday that I'm not going to name, and I personally didn't feel safe uh, leaving that school around 5, 30, 6 o'clock. And some of the school district staff already know some of my concerns because I communicated them on last night. But one of the biggest issues um, exiting that particular school was lighting. So first, cameras. Where are we with cameras? And um, especially in our comprehensive neighborhood high schools and middle schools. And what are we doing about some of the lighting problems that we have as it relates to our facilities? Mr. Chairman, I'd like to defer to Chief of Safety, Mr. Kevin Bethel. Mr. Bethel. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, good, good afternoon. So as it relates to cameras, you know, I, I've shared this with, with the team. You know, in 2019, when I arrived, I realized we have a significant issue with cameras. Uh, almost 170 of our cameras are still analog cameras. And so, you know, as a result of that, we were really going through a process of piecemealing, trying to put together a system that was ultimately failing. You know, taking parts from one one system to put onto other system. Um, uh, two year year ago, I met with the capital team, and they invested in giving us an ability to audit the entire system to see exactly what the state of the cameras were. Uh, and to, you know, to no surprise, it came back very telling the level of deterioration we've had in our camera systems going back decades. Um, and so what of that process from that report, um, it be, we were able to make a determination. It's a multi-million dollar capital budget project that we will be presenting to the capital team on the capital call uh, to start the conversation around making significant investments in our camera systems. Uh, we have up to this point been able to use grant money, uh, money from the state Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency. We've been able to use very few internal dollars as I moved to move more restorative work in our office. We didn't have those dollars to invest in cameras. So up to this point, we've been able to update and I give you a, a list, uh, Chairman, of all the schools we have done recently um, and, and the schools that are in the pipeline that we're doing now. Uh, we're just able to get, get some additional dollars investments to be able to hire vendors for the first time to support our, per, our work. We have about 110 uh, uh, reports of cameras that are not working and we're working diligently to, to address that. I'm thankful to Reggie McNeil. We had an issue with bucket trucks to get out into the exterior of our cameras because they were so high. We were able to get, invest that and get that bucket truck from our, our from our facility team this year. So we are moving forward. Just want to be cautioning you that the cameras were, that around our school were never built to be community cameras. They were really built to be looking internally, oftentimes at our best door and our doors to see the entrance and exit and not really facing out into the community. Our new modeling and the new the digital uh, work we're using gives that ability. But I, I would I would share with you that we're working diligently uh, to try to upgrade, but it is going to take a period of time uh, because the system has been allowed to. And I understand that this is an educational system and the dollars were not there to be able to invest in the in, the, in those cameras. But we're really looking for other dollars now, capital dollars, grant dollars to really bring our system up online. We have a Google Doc that all principals allowed to invest in and let notify us when they have a problem with their cameras. Um, as far as the lightings, uh, I think that would probably be more of the facility questions. I've not been asked at this point from any of the school leaders around uh, lighting around their schools, uh, but I'm sure those may have been coming through the facilities portal with my colleague, uh, Chief McNeil. Thank you, Mr. Bethel. And I just want to take a moment since you came on just to commend you for all the work that you've done and how responsive you've been to myself as well as this legislative body. Your work is very much appreciated. Um, if someone can get back to us prior to the next time we talk when we uh, convene around the budget, uh, we would like to know not necessarily the schools where you have done these improvements. We would like to know all of the schools who have issues around cameras, how much it costs, how long do you think it would uh, take us to fix these issues? Because at the end of the day, if you don't have the money in your budget, I'm sure that we can find some dollars and resources to make sure that we have cameras. Uh, Mr. Bethel, I understand exactly what you're saying as far as the difference between um, the exterior focus of cameras compared to the interior focus. So just let me be clear. I'm talking about the interior focus of cameras that look specifically at schools. And I'm also talking about athletic facilities where I've communicated a number of different times have safety concerns because of lighting. So when I'm talking about lighting, um, this isn't the first time I've brought this up. I've been to a number of our facilities that are just not up to par, that do not have the proper lighting. We uh, unfortunately can't do a lot of night athletic activities because of lighting issues. And, and where there are lighting issues, and we do have 
um, athletic activities. Uh, Mr. Bethel, your team is often spread very thin uh, because you're forced to police areas that you don't necessarily have to police because um, if the lighting was was there, and I'll specifically reference the Northeast High School super site again, if the lighting was there and if it was appropriate, uh, we wouldn't need as many school police to staff the events that take place at that particular super site. So if we can get a list of schools um, that are having this internal lighting issues, as well as schools dealing with um, infrastructure issues, specifically looking at athletic activities, uh, if we can get that information prior to the budget, as well as in a, uh, an estimated timeline, um, as it relates to how long it would take for those exact same schools to get uh, the materials that they need if the money were to be granted, that will help us do our job and be supportive in the work that you're doing. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, next question. Um, so one of the other things that came up at our education debrief last week was concerns around schools who have multiple ways to enter and exit and the fact that their doors have to remain open and they don't have enough staff. So earlier I asked you about vacancies as it relates to climate staff. Um, the reason I asked that question is because, um, again, it starts with the enrollment numbers being low, staff numbers get low. We have these buildings and these facilities that we don't want to see close. Uh, but we're, what we're seeing is we're seeing some levels of concern from facilitators, from administrators, as it relates to keeping buildings safe because of the number of entrances and exits that the buildings have and because they don't have enough staff to monitor all of those um, interests and exits. So what is the plan to address that particular issue? Chairman Thomas, I'll, I'll speak to the issue of, of the of the doors and, and I think my uh, Chief McNeil may jump in as well. I mean, that has always been a challenge for our schools. I mean, we have schools that in some schools have upward of 150 doors. So I, I, even with the staffing, I mean, it, it, it has always and consistently will keep a, a challenge because of the fire codes and, and the issue of not being able to stop the, the, uh, the exit of those doors. Um, we are looking at some new technology with the cameras as we go into it, our insulation process. Uh, I most recently visited a, a, a company up in New York that would be able to share some kind of other things we could be using to help us secure those doors. I did meet with my colleague, uh, uh, Reggie McNeil, to have a conversation around uh, his most recently started doing assessment of some of the doors to see exactly um, what they look like and, and what we could be doing to those doors. Um, but but it is it is has and will always be. And even from a staffing perspective, you know, a, a great challenge just because of the number of doors. I mean, a school with 150 exit doors. Um, that that is challenging and and a, and, a, and a daunting task, particularly when kids are are, are hell bent on getting out of the building and, and find a door uh, that is least uh, in in the public eye. Um, I don't know if Reggie wanted to come in and talk about his work around the doors, uh, but we are walking down that process now to try to determine what what's the best way to make that secure door uh, without uh, you know undermining the the safety concerns and the fire codes that we have to comply with. Sure, absolutely. And I mean, I don't want to uh, belabor the point, but I'm thinking thinking about Lean On Me, right? This is a movie that came out in 1989 that had this exact same problem, right? And at the end of the day, uh, one of the solutions that I, and I'm hearing, you know, was Joe Clark, the principal. I hear, I'm hearing his voice right now as I'm listening to you. One of the solutions that came out of our um, education debrief conversation last week was apparently there are some schools that have magnetic locks. And apparently what happens with the schools that have magnetic locks is that they can easily open and close their doors um, at the switch of a button without um, having those concerns around fire safety and fire hazards that you just communicated. Uh, so I'm wondering from an infrastructure per perspective, um, have we looked into this idea of investing in these magnetic locks that some schools in the city of Philadelphia already has that gives administrators the opportunity to be able to address this issue. Is that a part of our capital planning? Are we looking at implementing something like that? As um, I see that being a possible solution to all these um, interests and exits as it relates to our schools. Uh, Council Chair, so this is Reggie McNeil. Just to answer that question, um, simply to say, yes, we are looking at magnetic locks. We've completed an exterior door assessment in all of our high schools um, in collaboration with Chief Bethel. 
Um, we just got that report back, and that is something that we will use to drive the prioritization of the work in the school district um, in regards to the capital funding. So when we revisit this conversation as it relates to budget, um, that's one of the things that we're going to hopefully have uh, some more in-depth information on when we're thinking about the crime and public safety issues. And, you know, I heard the school board mention um, some of the safety of our our teachers. I think that if I'm a teacher and as a former teacher, yeah, there's concern walking from my car to the actual school. But there's also concern of what happens in that day and who's able to come freely in and out of the building. Uh, so I will put this up there um, just as important as the issue around parking spaces, if not more important, uh, so we can make sure that the people who are actually in our facility are safe. And we'll love to look forward to our actual plan as it relates to what we can do around the entrances and exits. Um, I'm going to move on from safety because I think that uh, we're going to continue this dialogue as it relates to the conversations that we'll be having moving forward. And I'm going to move uh, to curriculum. Um, one of the one of the things that uh, we've talked about today um, is this idea of literacy and literacy rates in the city of Philadelphia. Um, I'm wondering from a, a curriculum perspective, uh, what 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 grades are you focusing on? as it relates to improving the literacy rate. As a former teacher, um, you know, I know we can't just talk about literacy across the board. We have to have some uh, targeted investment and targeted goals as it relates to literacy. So where is our focal point as it relates to really moving the numbers around literacy and what are we doing to address this crisis as it relates to our students not getting a quality education? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the Board of Education has been very clear in its goals and guardrails that it expects the district to get better in three through eight English language arts. Now, uh, there are a couple of ways that we're focused on doing that. One strategy must be hardwired, focusing on that K2 area and before kids actually even get to us. Most school districts pour a lot of resources into K2. And uh, or I'll say a lot of school districts. I won't say most because I, I don't know that to be the case. A lot of school districts pour a lot of resources into K2. I just want to remind us, though, that all of the brain research on young children tells us that a lot of those dendrites and things uh, have some activity around the age of three. So we've got to not just focus on a K2 strategy or the middle grade strategy. We've got to, in the strategic plan process, figure out how do we connect with kids before they even come to kindergarten or pre-K through public-private partnerships. Uh, there are some that actually have uh, young kids in school buildings sharing space, learning just like uh, K-5 students. So that's one. Two, uh, we're taking a hard look at what we might do to increase uh, our training and work around the science of reading. And three, we're taking the time to audit what's working and what's not. If we have a decade of flat reading performance at third grade, and I believe Councilmember Jones said it better than I can about what happens when kids can't read by, or don't read on grade level as measured by some kind of standardized assessment by third or fourth grade, what that portends for the future. Uh, we, we need to take the time, quite frankly, and, I'm, and the board has given me time to really dig into what are the reasons for our lack of improvement at third grade. And I'll have more to say about that as we complete that work in the strategic plan. Okay, that's great because I'm, I'm I'm very curious to hear the, the report and the scores as it relates to the critical dive you're doing. Uh, because at the end of the day, what I haven't really heard is any modification in curriculum. Like um, when I look at uh, the impact that technology has had on what education looks like post pandemic, um, I'm wondering what are we doing as it relates to te teaching technology cross curriculum uh, to put us in a position to try our best to address some of these issues. We talked about the learning gap. We know we still have issues as it relates to truancy and attendance. So I'm wondering, are we using technology to supplement some of this stuff? And I'm wondering what, you know, curriculum uh, modifications have taken place in order to put us in a position to do a little bit better. So as you continue to do a deeper dive, I look forward uh, to hearing that. I got to take a step back to safety for one second because there was an important question that came out of the debrief last week that I didn't essentially get a chance to ask. Um, how often do you are you aware of or anybody on your team is aware of when uh, an incident takes place at a school? And the administrators or the teacher, dean, whoever it may be, they call 911 and they do not get a response. Is that a practice that happens significantly? Um, we That was communicated to us last week. And I'm wondering how many complaints like that have you gotten from your schools as it relates to 
an incident taking place. And I'm not talking about a serious incident like a shooting or something like that. I'm talking about a fight. Chief Bethel? Yes, uh, Chairman. So so there are incidences times. I won't say there are not times when, when our, our, our school leaders call the police and they're not able to come. But I would say that for the most part, that was a very, very uh, limited. Um, we have, fortunately, as you know, we have, our, I don't know the exact numbers, but several police officers assigned specifically to our schools to support us on a daily basis. And so many of your school leaders are able to call those police officers directly versus calling 911. We also provide, uh, we have office hours every two weeks with myself and Commissioner Joel Dales, where we give the opportunity in the newsletter, any principals having any problem with police response or any concerns around my staff response or overall safety, uh, they can call into that number, uh, come into the room and we have those discussions. Are there times that there are challenges? Yes. Yeah. I mean, that the, the 911 response is not as quick as they're possible. We encourage our school leaders then to call our dispatch so we can deploy, in many cases, we're deploying our personnel in lieu of the police officers responding, or we'll call directly because of our lease with the police department, we can call into the administrative line. So just as anything else, you know, the, as you know, they get ranked as they come in and, into the call center. A fight in and of itself is going to get a very low ranking unless it's something significant because there may be something more emerging happening, particularly during our dismissal times and the like. Uh, but we do work in collaboration with the police department, identify some of those times when they're not, follow up with the, the captain and the police department when they don't to try to minimize that to as, as much as possible. But there are always are times where just like anything, if they call for a low level offense, they may not get immediate response. Can we get specific data around this? Can there, like you said, you're keeping a database. Can we get access to information so we understand how often this does or does not happen? And also, um, Mr. Bethel, just I know you uh, have a lot of credibility, a lot of respect in the city. You wore a number of different hats. I'm curious, when do shift changes happen for police officers? Um, it, what it time vary. Uh, it, usually it happens right after our, our let out. Uh, you know, it's, it's a very critical time. Um, I, don't, I guess for the, I know this is a public session, but uh, I would just say that, that oftentimes when those men and women are, now I'll say the school officers have pretty much set their time around the school day. So they are out a little bit longer. But as it relates to the other responding personnel, the shift change normally is happening at the same time as our schools are letting out. So, so um, Mr. Superintendent, what, what time of day do most of our schools let out? Especially, um, yeah, what, what time of day is that? What, what, what would you approximate most, most schools are dismissed at? Not of our, not of our schools let out at the exact same time. So uh, when you made some adjustments over time to school days, I want to make sure that uh, I think Chief McNeil can give us the exact uh, end times from operations because they know exactly what time they have transportation available for kids who, who use the public transportation. Yeah, so that's a that's a range. So I can tell you it's a range from around 2, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. OK, so schools start letting out around 2 p.m. And so during that two hour window is when most of our schools are being dismissed, starting at 2 p.m. and approximately ending at about 4 p.m. Um, right. And that I'm assuming is around the same time that we do shift change as it relates to our police officers. Um, I'm going to go ahead and task us uh, with that homework assignment to see what we can do to do a deeper dive and then making sure that we have more hands on deck and more people available as it relates to the time that our schools transition out. And I know that you talked earlier about the Safe Corridor program um, that puts us in a position to have community members help be a part of the dismissal process. But from a systemic perspective as a city, um, that's a huge issue that we have all this crime and all this violence in the city. And we have all these transitions taking place uh, between two and four that makes us a little bit, a uh, little, little vulnerable. And, and it leaves our children as um, as well as the, the adults that are involved as sitting ducks. Uh, so I'm hoping that we can collaborate around that particular issue and maybe come up with some innovative ideas and practices about what we can do um, to keep people safe between the hours of two and four when students are being dismissed and adults are asked to be out there uh, to try to help troubleshoot some of the concerns that may exist. Um, because of time purposes, I'm actually not going to go back to curriculum. I'll save those conversations, uh, those questions for another time. I'll just uh, close out with a couple things real quick. Um, one of the issues that was communicated to us at our debrief, as well as um, in other spaces, I'm sorry, Councilmember Harity, did you want to ask a question? Okay, I'm sorry. Um, one, of, one of the issues that was communicated to us 
um, is uh, just transparency, um, transparency around um, data sharing, uh, transparency around um, what's going on with our schools outside of conversations like this, um, uh, working relationships with our unions that represent our workers. Uh, so, so what's the district's plan around uh, transparency, communication, and making sure data and information is readily available uh, to teachers, um, to the unions that represent our, um, our our workers, to parents, stakeholders, as well as elected officials. Uh, pre uh, Mr. Chairman, you said what is? Would you repeat that? I didn't hear the last part. I've got a connection issue going on here. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll you know, um, one of the issues that was communicated to us um, at our debrief, as well as other complaints that have come to my office, concerns, I shouldn't say complaints, concerns that have come to my office, is just communication and transparency. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm sure you've gotten some uh, pushback as well. I'm sure school board members have gotten pushback as well, too. Um, so I'm just wondering, uh, what is the plan to address some of the communication and transparency concerns as it relates to dialogue with parents, as it relates to dialogue with students, um, as well as the unions that represent our workers. Uh, I will tell you that uh, we have a, a, a small group, including myself, of senior leaders and myself that are meeting regularly, uh, have begun to meet regularly with uh, many of our unions, have not gotten to all of them yet, but are committed to getting to all of them because we remember we want to work in partnership with unions, communities, parents, lots of other folks. Uh, secondly, um, uh, part of uh, the, the my reason for hiring Alexandra Coppich as the new chief of communications and customer service for the school district. Uh, she's uh, in the process of developing and will roll out several additional strategies for transparency and communication. She and our district spokesperson, uh, Monique Braxton, uh, We've uh, also brought aboard a new director of community engagement to help us be out in the community, Mr. Edwin Santana. And so between the work of those three people, uh, they're helping us to th rethink strategies across the district. Ms. Coppish, do you want to add anything else specifically to transparency and communication uh, from a communication standpoint? Sure, I can. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, in terms of transparency, we are trying to strengthen communications by updating our protocols, our procedures, and, and mainly focusing on how we build those bridges that Dr. Watlington had talked about. So making sure that our key stakeholders are informed first before media or any any person externally. So really trying to hone in on making sure that internally, whether it be the board or union leaders, our staff, students and families have all the relevant information that they need in order to, um, whether it be an initiative like school selection or, you know, urgent matters like inclement weather or, um, you know, things that are, you know, determined by the pandemic, whether it be masking policy. So all of those different issues, we're trying to make sure that our key stakeholders have timely information um, and that they are looped in and informed as uh, our primary audiences. So that is one way that we're doing it, but also executing um, some of the recommendations from the transition team. So whether that be a two-way customer service focused communications platform. So if you are a parent, if you are a student, if you are a teacher, if you are an elected official or community stakeholder, you can directly reach out to the district. Um, different from the face office, this is really going to be a customer service facing platform model where we will be able to track your inquiry or your compliment or your question and respond to it as quickly as possible. Thank you. Um, as we close out our conversation today, the last thing I'll, um, and I'll, let me make sure I'm doing this correctly. Oh, Chair recognizes Council Member Jones, Majority Leader Jones. Yeah, I just wanted to thank you for your indulgence. Um, Big ships don't turn quickly in big oceans, and it takes time. I respect and understand that. But with all that's at risk, you, you feel and hear uh, our members' urgency about advocating for the process to move as swiftly as possible. Um, I want to thank you for your open communications. I can always reach you. I can always reach Mr. Santana. 
when I have a concern or a comment. So I, I acknowledge and appreciate that. We will be working with you as closely as possible to try to answer some of the questions, deal with some of the concerns, and close some of the gaps for our students. So thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for being as patient with all of us as, as you have been. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Majority Leader. I appreciate it. Um, as we look to close out our conversation today, um, I could not uh, be who I am without having a brief conversation around sports and athletics in the city of Philadelphia. Um, we, um, as a legislative body, recently uh, advocated and fought for $50,000 to go to the PIAA um, District 12 to help address some of the safety concerns as it relates to athletic play. Uh, but one of the areas that I've been continuing to push is uh, for the district to put together uh, some capital plan and investment as it relates to facilities so our facilities are modernized and a little safer and i'm looking forward to continuing that dialogue uh, but here today uh, one of the bills that i introduced in council a little while back is the nil protection act looking to uh, make sure that we have the different mechanisms and support systems in place for young people across the city of philadelphia uh, the piaa uh, recently voted in december to allow for name image and likeness opportunities for student athletes across the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Uh, Mr. Superintendent, what are you and your team doing as it relates to um, this new NIL um, legislation? Um, how many student athletes in a school district have received NIL deals? And how do you anticipate this um, impacting interscholastic athletics? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, transparently, uh, I, I am not fully up to date on the NIL legislation and the subsequent data for the for our students. Uh, I will ask if Mr. McNeil or perhaps uh, Ms. Karen Lynch, who oversees uh, uh, athletics and student services, has any additional information that I may not be able to share. And, and before they start, if Mr. I can just uh, if I can just uh, this this also might be something that might require a policy. Our, uh, look at our policy. So thank you for uh, signaling that as well, um, as well for us uh, to guide the district on how we move forward in those, because this is kind of a fast moving train. The Supreme Court case came down and said that, you know, college athletes can have name, image, likeness. Uh, thank goodness. Um, and our, our student athletes should have benefit from that as well. So um, that, that thinking as well. So thanks for bringing that to our to, to the floor, Chair. But go ahead. District Mr. Center. President, I'm not sure if Dr. Jimmy Lynch, our district athletic director, is, is here with us. Uh, Dr. Lynch, are you with us? Or uh, Karen Lynch, if you can, are, are you prepared to speak to that? If not, we'll, we're happy to uh, take that as a homework assignment, Mr. Chairman. That's fine. We could table it for another time. Uh, we can continue this dialogue at another time. I don't want to put folks in a position to have a conversation about something that they weren't necessarily prepared to uh, discuss right now. I know I kind of threw a curveball with that question. Um, but I did want to just at least put it on the record to see where we are and what we're looking to do moving forward. And we could just make sure that we have some type of response when we have our monthly meeting uh, with the Education Committee. That would definitely be ideal. Um, Mr. Superintendent, what I would like to do is pass it to you uh, for any closing remarks, anything you feel like wasn't discussed today. Um, just give you and your team um, or President Streeter an opportunity uh, to address anything that you didn't get an opportunity to or communicate anything that you didn't get a chance to communicate. I'm happy to follow President Streeter, sir. I mean, the only thing that I would add is uh, just a big shout out to the parents and also want to ask parents to engage with us. I know that uh, some schools, some teachers now have virtual mechanisms where you can do parent teacher conferences through Zoom. Um, you can do and I know everybody doesn't have access to technology, but any and any and all opportunities where the district is asking for engagement, we actually do listen. I know there's a perception in the past that the district just does what it wants to do, irrespective of engagement. But Dr. Wallington and the board is committed to uh, moving to a space where policy and big shifts are, uh, are we, we hear from the public and hear from parents um, and other on all stakeholders. So that's the, that's the last thing I want to do, kind of like, please reach out, please engage uh, with the process. So while so while we're making the cake, we can make sure we're putting the right ingredients in it. And, and to board President Streeter's point, I just want to say uh, uh, re really excited to continue to work under the leadership of our Board of Education. And I would say to uh, you, Mr. Chairman and Council, that we will ask you to continue to support our staff. They're working hard. We know we have a lot of work to do. We're committed to doing it. So I'm just going to ask on behalf of our 19,000 employees and families 
that we support our staff and support continue to support our budgets. Do all you can to support us and we will certainly appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you both and thank you for your leadership. Um, are there any other questions or comments from members of this committee um, for the witnesses that we have here today? Hearing none, seeing none, uh, this public meeting and public hearing uh, are recessed at the call of the chair. I want to thank you. Mr. Chair, this is oh, John Christian. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, we will now at this point recess the public meeting and move into the public hearing where I think we had uh, two people sign up for public comment. Uh -huh. So if. Right, so we could adjourn the, the meeting and move into the public hearing. Thank as you, your, you know, following your lead. So uh, seeing, seeing that we have no other comments and no other uh, questions, um, this concludes the public meeting of the committee of the Council Committee of the Whole and the Board of Education. We will now go into our public hearing. Those who are um, not members of the committee may disconnect. And again, we want to thank you for being a part of our conversation today. And uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, our first witness was Miss Lisa Haver. Lisa, are you there? Are you available? Hello? Lisa, are you there? Are you available? Yes, I am. Good afternoon. Please <laughs> state your name for the record and you may begin with your testimony. Good afternoon, members of City Council, Chair Thomas. My name is Lisa Haber. <clears throat> I'm co-founder and coordinator of the Alliance for Philadelphia Public Schools. We are a grassroots organization of parents, educators, retired educators, and community members. We've attended board meetings and before that SRC meetings for over 10 years. Many city council members receive our monthly reports. We begin this year with a new board president, a new superintendent, a new chair of City Council's Education Committee, and several new council members. Next year, we'll have a new mayor. So the question that we bring is, with all of this new leadership, will that bring any real change for the city's public schools? Or will the status quo be maintained, as it has through so many superintendents and so many changes in governance? Will the spending priorities of the board change so that fewer dollars go to outsourcing and consultants and more to classrooms? Or will district leadership just keep blaming Harrisburg? Will education be better for the city's children? This board was reinstated in 2018 after 17 years of state control. What substantial and meaningful improvement has been seen in our schools? The board and the district talks about goals and guardrails. You've heard them mention it about 50 times today. Golden Guardrails monitors data. Data means standardized tests. Testing means less instruction and less creative and enjoyable learning. That means maintaining the status quo. Two hours of data analysis at every public meeting means two hours of not listening to the public and not coming up with solutions to issues. Will this board bring true accountability to the highly compensated operators of privately managed schools. We hear that charter schools are public schools, but there are no public hearings on five-year charter renewals. It was good to hear President Streeter take some steps toward that last week, but we need a lot more accountability for those schools. This board leadership has already begun talking about the possibility of closing public schools. Council must take a strong stand against the board taking even one more neighborhood school away. A lot of what was talked about here at this meeting today, I've been listening since the beginning, is safety. Um, at the last board meeting, an item for more police presence around schools was passed and funding was, was approved for that. One reason our children are less safe is that many of them have to travel farther to school after the mass closures of 2013. When the board says it will advocate for the public schools, what does that mean when they also say they want to depoliticize education? How does the board advocate for what the community wants when it shuts the community out? The first step 
that this new board leadership c- can take as it repeatedly invokes parent and community engagement is to restore full speaking rights to the public. Lift the arbitrary caps and restore the full three-minute time for people to be heard. What is it going to take, really, to change the status quo? I think for people listening to this hearing all day, we really haven't heard much of that. But some very real concrete things, smaller class size, bringing back certified school librarians, hiring more support staff, bringing back reading specialists. Those changes would mean a real change in the status quo. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Um, Mr. Ch- uh, Mr. Clerk, will you please call our next witness? Ms. Stephanie King. Yes. Hello. Hello? Uh, yes, yes, please state your name. We can hear you. Please state your name for the record, and you may begin with your testimony. Hi. Um, you can hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hello? Okay. Uh, good afternoon, council members, and thank you for having speakers today. My name is Stephanie King, and I'm the president of Kearney Friends at General Philip Kearney School in Northern Liberties where my children are in seventh and third grade. For those of you who are new to council or to the board, I've been coming to speak at these meetings since my eldest was in kindergarten because Northern Liberty still has completely segregated schools in 2023. And I've watched as my children have gone through repeated years of leveling and underfunding. I'm here today because I'm hopeful that with a new superintendent and new direction for the education committee, we might see some action to actually support the public schools in this city. You cannot have a functioning, prosperous city with opportunity for all residents if the people in charge only care about people who went to the prep or friend select and now send their children there. You cannot have a functioning relationship between council and the district when the only time the Education Committee holds a meeting is when Council Member O calls one for privileged parents to whine and complain about how their kid is no longer guaranteed a spot at Masterman or Central. It's great that Abbott Elementary is tearing up the ratings and winning awards, but it's no laughing matter to me that the most unrealistic part of the show is that their school has a library or that they have consistent staff while my kids never know if the teacher they start with in September will still be there in December. Privileged schools like Alexander and Henry and Meredith have band and orchestra and a school musical. My kids don't have a music teacher, and their classmates have to put their names in a hat to use one of the school violins. All anyone cares about is the magnet schools and the gold guardrail reports, but nobody actually does anything about any of it. You can't just keep shouting improve, improve, improve at schools when you're not giving them enough teachers or air conditioning or buses. You can't complain about learning loss if you're not giving us the resources to come back from it or curriculum if there aren't enough bodies in the building. The schools the city cares about get instruments and AP classes and everyone else gets security cameras. I want the members of council to do something for me the next time you're looking at a goals and guardrail report. Look at the demographics of the on-track schools versus the off-track schools. This city knows exactly who it's giving the quote-unquote good schools to. Everybody here cares about the top 10 or so elementary schools and maybe five magnet high schools, and that's it. That is, when the city's not handing millions of dollars over to charter school companies so that they can buy bus wraps to sell us the idea that they're a solution to the problem they helped cause. I'm tired of it. All the information is right in front of you if you look. If the new council members and a new mayor care enough to say that public schools are a public good and necessary to make our city strong, if instead of constantly wringing our hands about the violence on our streets, 
we admit that this city isn't giving our kids a light at the end of the tunnel to look forward to. I hope that council will use its renewed interest in education to listen to some of the voices who have been speaking out all this time and getting shut down by the board, and not just committees full of insiders hand-picked out of 440, or the same 10 center city schools that care more about banning masks than whether kids in other parts of town have enough teachers. There are a lot of people who care about all of our city's public schools, and we need more council members to start being among them. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Mr. Clerk, will you please call the next witness to testify? There are no other witnesses for public comment, Chairman. Seeing none, uh, this public meeting and public hearing are recess at the call of the chair. I want to say thank you, everybody, for attending today. It's very much appreciated, and I look forward to continuing this conversation and continuing the good work for the people of Philadelphia, but most importantly for our children. Thank you, Mr. Christmas. Thank you to the tech team, and um, please try to get yourself some lunch. It's been a long morning. Thank you, everybody. All right, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Have a good day, everybody.